Chapter fifty four of the Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loon. Chapter fifty four The Holy Alliance. As soon as Napoleon had been sent to St. Helena, the rulers who so often had been defeated by the hated Corsican met at Vienna and tried to undo the many changes that had been brought about by the French Revolution. The Imperial Highnesses, the Royal Highnesses, their graces, the Dukes, the Ministers Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary, together with the Plain Excellencies and their army of secretaries, servants, and hangers-on, whose labors had been so rudely interrupted by the sudden return of the terrible Corsican, now sweltering under the hot sun of St. Helena, went back to their jobs, the victory was duly celebrated with dinners, garden parties, and balls, at which the new and very shocking waltz was danced to the great scandal of the ladies and gentlemen who remembered the minuet of the old regime. For almost a generation they had lived in retirement. At last the danger was over. They were very eloquent upon the subject of the terrible hardships which they had suffered, and they expected to be recompensed for every penny they had lost at the hands of the unspeakable Jacobins, who had dared to kill their anointed king, who had abolished wigs, and who had discarded the short trousers of the court of Versailles for the ragged pantaloons of the Parisian slums. You may think it absurd that I should mention such a detail, but, if you please, the Congress of Vienna was one long succession of such absurdities, and for many months the question of short trousers versus long trousers interested the delegates more than the future settlement of the Saxon or Spanish problems. His Majesty the King of Prussia went so far as to order a pair of short ones, that he might give public evidence of his contempt for everything revolutionary. Another German potentate, not to be outdone in this noble hatred for the revolution, decreed that all taxes which his subjects had paid to the French usurper should be paid a second time to the legitimate ruler, who had loved his people from afar while they were at the mercy of the Corsican ogre, and so on from one blunder to another, until one gasps, and exclaims, but why in the name of high heaven did not the people object? Why not indeed? Because the people were utterly exhausted, were desperate, did not care what happened, or how, or where, or by whom they were ruled, provided there was peace. They were sick and tired of war and revolution and reform. In the eighties of the previous century, they had all danced around the tree of liberty, Princes had embraced their cooks, and duchesses had danced the Carmagnole with their lackeys in the honest belief that the millennium of equality and fraternity had at last dawned upon this wicked world. Instead of the millennium, they had been visited by the revolutionary commissary, who had lodged a dozen dirty soldiers in their parlor, and had stolen the family plate when he returned to Paris to report to his government upon the enthusiasm with which the liberated country had received the Constitution which the French people had presented to their good neighbors. When they had heard how the last outbreak of revolutionary disorder in Paris had been suppressed by a young officer called Bonaparte, or Buonaparte, who had turned his guns upon the mob, they gave a sigh of relief. A little less liberty, fraternity, and equality seemed a very desirable thing. But, ere long, the young officer called Bonaparte, or Bonaparte, became one of the three consuls of the French Republic then sole consul, and finally emperor. As he was much more efficient than any ruler that had ever been seen before, his hand pressed heavily upon his poor subjects. He showed them no mercy. He impressed their sons into his armies, he married their daughters to his generals, and he took their pictures and their statues to enrich his own museums. He turned the whole of Europe into an armed camp, and killed almost an entire generation of men. Now he was gone, and the people, except a few professional military men, had but one wish. They wanted to be let alone. For a while they had been allowed to rule themselves, to vote for mayors and aldermen and judges. The system had been a terrible failure. The new rulers had been inexperienced and extravagant. From sheer despair the people turned to the representative men of the old regime. You rule us, they said, as you used to do. Tell us what we owe you for taxes, and leave us alone. We are busy repairing the damage of the age of liberty. 
The men who stage managed the famous Congress certainly did their best to satisfy this longing for rest and quiet. The Holy Alliance, the main result of the Congress, made the policeman the most important dignitary of the state, and held out the most terrible punishment to those who dared criticize a single official act. Europe had peace, but it was the peace of the cemetery. The three most important men at Vienna were the Emperor Alexander of Russia, Metternich, who represented the interests of the Austrian House of Habsburg, and Talleyrand, the erstwhile Bishop of Autun, who had managed to live through the different changes in the French government by the sheer force of his cunning and his intelligence, and who now travelled to the Austrian capital to save for his country whatever could be saved from the Napoleonic ruin. Like this gay young man of the Limerick, who never knew when he was slighted, this unbidden guest came to the party and ate just as heartily as if he had been really invited. Indeed, before long, he was sitting at the head of the table, entertaining everybody with his amusing stories, and gaining the company's good will by the charm of his manner. Before he had been in Vienna twenty-four hours, he knew that the Allies were divided into two hostile camps. On the one side were Russia, who wanted to take Poland, and Prussia, who wanted to annex Saxony, and on the other side were Austria and England, who were trying to prevent this grab, because it was against their own interests that either Prussia or Russia should be able to dominate Europe. Talleyrand played the two sides against each other with great skill, and it was due to his efforts that the French people were not made to suffer for the ten years of oppression which Europe had endured at the hands of the imperial officials. He argued that the French people had been given no choice in the matter. Napoleon had forced them to act at his bidding. But Napoleon was gone, and Louis the Eighteenth was on the throne. Give him a chance, Talleyrand pleaded, and the Allies, glad to see a legitimate king upon the throne of a revolutionary country, obligingly yielded, and the Bourbons were given their chance, of which they made such use that they were driven out after fifteen years. The second man of the triumvirate of Vienna was Metternich, the Austrian Prime Minister, the leader of the foreign policy of the House of Habsburg. Wenzel Lothar, Prince of Metternich Winneberg, was exactly what the name suggests. He was a grand seigneur, a very handsome gentleman with very fine manners, immensely rich and very able, but the product of a society which lived a thousand miles away from the sweating multitudes who worked and slaved in the cities and on the farms. As a young man, Metternich had been studying at the University of Strasbourg when the French Revolution broke out. Strasbourg, the city which gave birth to the Marseillaise, had been a center of Jacobin activities. Metternich remembered that his pleasant social life had been sadly interrupted, that a lot of incompetent citizens had suddenly been called forth to perform tasks for which they were not fit, that the mob had celebrated the dawn of the new liberty by the murder of perfectly innocent persons. He had failed to see the honest enthusiasm of the masses, the ray of hope in the eyes of women and children who carried bread and water to the ragged troops of the convention, marching through the city on their way to the front and a glorious death for the French fatherland. The whole thing had filled the young Austrian with disgust. It was uncivilized. If there were any fighting to be done, it must be done by dashing young men in lovely uniforms, charging across the green fields on well-groomed horses. But to turn an entire country into an evil-smelling armed camp where tramps were overnight promoted to be generals, that was both wicked and senseless. See what came of all your fine ideas, he would say to the French diplomats, whom he met at a quiet little dinner given by one of the innumerable Austrian Grand Dukes. You wanted liberty, equality, and fraternity, and you got Napoleon. How much better it would have been if you had been contented with the existing order of things. And he would explain his system of stability. He would advocate a return to the normalcy of the good old days before the war when everybody was happy, and nobody talked nonsense about everybody being as good as everybody else. In this attitude, he was entirely sincere, and as he was an able man of great strength of will and a tremendous power of persuasion, he was one of the many dangerous enemies of the revolutionary ideas. He did not die until the year 1859, and he therefore lived long enough to see the complete failure of all his policies when they were swept aside by the revolution of the year 1848. He then found himself the most hated man of Europe, and more than once ran the risk of being lynched by angry crowds of outraged citizens. But until the very last, he remained steadfast in his belief that he had done the right thing. 
Here you see a picture of a very large three-masted ship, says off for Trafalgar. He had always been convinced that people preferred peace to liberty, and he had tried to give them what was best for them. And in all fairness, it ought to be said that his efforts to establish universal peace were fairly successful. The great powers did not fly at each other's throat for almost forty years. Indeed, not until the Crimean War between Russia and England, France and Italy and Turkey in the year 1854. That means a record for the European continent. Here you see a picture of a shadow standing above the clouds, and it says, The Spectre Which Frightened the Holy Alliance. The third hero of this waltzing congress was the Emperor Alexander. He had been brought up at the court of his grandmother, the famous Catherine the Great. Between the lessons of this shrewd old woman, who taught him to regard the glory of Russia as the most important thing in life, and those of his private tutor, a Swiss admirer of Voltaire and Rousseau, who filled his mind with a general love of humanity, the boy grew up to be a strange mixture of a selfish tyrant and a sentimental revolutionist. He had suffered great indignities during the life of his crazy father, Paul I. He had been obliged to witness the wholesale slaughter of the Napoleonic battlefields. Then the tide had turned. His armies had won the day for the Allies. Russia had become the savior of Europe, and the Tsar of his mighty people was acclaimed as a half-god who would cure the world of its many ills. Here you see a very large, almost empty room that showing four men at a table that's titled The Real Congress of Vienna. But Alexander was not very clever. He did not know men and women as Talleyrand and Metternich knew them. He did not understand the strange game of diplomacy. He was vain, who would not be under the circumstances, and loved to hear the applause of the multitude, and soon he had become the main attraction of the Congress, while Metternich and Talleyrand and Castlereagh, the very able British representative, sat around a table and drank a bottle of Tokay, and decided what was actually going to be done. They needed Russia, and therefore they were very polite to Alexander, but the less he had personally to do with the actual work of the Congress, the better they were pleased. They even encouraged his plans for a holy alliance, that he might be fully occupied while they were engaged upon the work at hand. Alexander was a sociable person, who liked to go to parties and meet people. Upon such occasions he was happy and gay, but there was a very different element in his character. He tried to forget something which he could not forget. On the night of the 23rd of March of the year 1801, he had been sitting in a room of the St. Michael Palace in Petersburg, waiting for the news of his father's abdication. But Paul had refused to sign the document which the drunken officers had placed before him on the table, and in their rage they had put a scarf around his neck and had strangled him to death. Then they had gone downstairs to tell Alexander that he was emperor of all the Russian lands. The memory of this terrible night stayed with the Tsar, who was a very sensitive person. He had been educated in the school of the great French philosophers who did not believe in God, but in human reason. But reason alone could not satisfy the emperor in his predicament. He began to hear voices, and see things. He tried to find a way by which he could square himself with his conscience. He became very pious and began to take an interest in mysticism, that strange love of the mysterious and the unknown, which is as old as the temples of Thebes and Babylon. The tremendous emotion of the great revolutionary era had influenced the character of the people of that day in a strange way. Men and women who had lived through twenty years of anxiety and fear were no longer quite normal. They jumped whenever the doorbell rang. It might mean the news of the death on the field of honor of an only son. The phrases about brotherly love and liberty of the revolution were hollow words in the ears of sorely stricken peasants. They clung to anything that might give them a new hold on the terrible problems of life. In their grief and misery, they were easily imposed upon by a large number of impostors who posed as prophets and preached a strange new doctrine which they dug out of the more obscure passages of the Book of Revelations. In the year 1814, Alexander, who had already consulted a large number of wonder doctors, heard of a new CRS, who was fortune-telling the coming doom of the world, and was exhorting people to repent ere it be too late. The Baroness von Krudner, the lady in question, was a Russian woman of uncertain age and similar reputation, who had been the wife of a Russian diplomat in the days of the Emperor Paul. She had squandered her husband's money, and had disgraced him by her strange love affairs. She had lived a very dissolute life until her nerves had given way, 
and for a while she was not in her right mind. Then she had been converted by the sight of the sudden death of a friend. Thereafter she despised all gaiety. She confessed her former sins to her shoemaker, a pious Moravian brother, a follower of the old reformer John Huss, who had been burned for his heresies by the Council of Constance in the year 1415. The next ten years the baroness spent in Germany making a specialty of the conversion of kings and princes. To convince Alexander, the saviour of Europe, of the error of his ways was the greatest ambition of her life. And, as Alexander, in his misery, was willing to listen to anybody who brought him a ray of hope, the interview was easily arranged. On the evening of the 4th of June in the year 1815, she was admitted to the tent of the emperor. She found him reading his Bible. We do not know what she said to Alexander, but when she left him three hours later, he was bathed in tears, and vowed that at last his soul had found peace. From that day on, the baroness was his faithful companion and his spiritual adviser. She followed him to Paris, and then to Vienna, and the time which Alexander did not spend dancing, he spent at the Krudener prayer meetings. You may ask why I tell you this story in such great detail? Are not the social changes of the nineteenth century of greater importance than the career of an ill-balanced woman, who had better be forgotten? Of course they are, but there exist any number of books which will tell you of these other things with great accuracy and in great detail. I want you to learn something more from this history than a mere succession of facts. I want you to approach all historical events in a frame of mind that will take nothing for granted. Don't be satisfied with the mere statement that such and such a thing happened then and there. Try to discover the hidden motives behind every action, and then you will understand the world around you much better, and you will have a greater chance to help others, which, when all is said and done, is the only truly satisfactory way of living. I do not want you to think of the Holy Alliance as a piece of paper which was signed in the year 1815, and lies dead and forgotten somewhere in the archives of state. It may be forgotten, but it is by no means dead. The Holy Alliance was directly responsible for the promulgation of the Monroe Doctrine, and the Monroe Doctrine of America for the Americans has a very distinct bearing upon your own life. That is the reason why I want you to know exactly how this document happened to come into existence, and what the real motives were underlying this outward manifestation of piety and Christian devotion to duty. The Holy Alliance was the joint labor of an unfortunate man who had suffered a terrible mental shock and who was trying to pacify his much-disturbed soul, and of an ambitious woman, who after a wasted life had lost her beauty and her attraction, and who satisfied her vanity and her desire for notoriety by assuming the role of self-appointed messiah of a new and strange creed. I am not giving away any secrets when I tell you these details. Such sober-minded people as Castlera, Metternich, and Talleyrand fully understood the limited abilities of the sentimental baroness. It would have been easy for Metternich to send her back to her German estates. A few lines to the almighty commander of the imperial police, and the thing was done. But France and England and Austria depended upon the good will of Russia. They could not afford to offend Alexander. And they tolerated the silly old baroness because they had to. And while they regarded the Holy Alliance as utter rubbish, and not worth the paper upon which it was written, they listened patiently to the Tsar when he read them the first rough draft of his attempt to create the brotherhood of men upon a basis of the Holy Scriptures. For this is what the Holy Alliance tried to do, and the signers of the document solemnly declared that they would, in the administration of their respective states, and in their political relations with every other government, take for their sole guide the precepts of that holy religion, namely the precepts of justice, Christian charity, and peace, which far from being applicable only to private concerns, must have an immediate influence on the councils of princes, and must guide all their steps as being the only means of consolidating human institutions and remedying their imperfections. They then proceeded to promise each other that they would remain united by the bonds of a true and indissoluble fraternity, and considering each other as fellow countrymen, they would on all occasions, and in all places, lend each other aid and assistance and more words to the same effect. Eventually the Holy Alliance was signed by the Emperor of Austria, who did not understand a word of it. It was signed by the Bourbons, who needed the friendship of Napoleon's old enemies. It was signed by the King of Prussia, who hoped to gain Alexander for his plans for a greater Prussia, and by all the little nations of Europe who were at the mercy of Russia. 
England never signed, because Casparat thought the whole thing buncombe. The Pope did not sign because he resented this interference in his business by a Greek Orthodox and a Protestant, and the Sultan did not sign because he never heard of it. The general mass of the European people, however, soon were forced to take notice. Behind the hollow phrases of the Holy Alliance stood the armies of the quintuple alliance which Metternich had created among the great powers. These armies meant business. They let it be known that the peace of Europe must not be disturbed by the so-called liberals, who were in reality nothing but disguised Jacobins, and hoped for a return of the revolutionary days. The enthusiasm for the great wars of liberation of the years 1812, 1813, 1814, and 1815 had begun to wear off. It had been followed by a sincere belief in the coming of a happier day. The soldiers, who had borne the brunt of the battle, wanted peace, and they said so. But they did not want the sort of peace which the Holy Alliance and the Council of the European Powers had now bestowed upon them. They cried that they had been betrayed but they were careful, lest they be heard by a secret police spy. The reaction was victorious. It was a reaction caused by men, who sincerely believed that their methods were necessary for the good of humanity. But it was just as hard to bear as if their intentions had been less kind, and it caused a great deal of unnecessary suffering, and greatly retarded the orderly progress of political development. End of chapter 54 Recorded by Michelle Crandall Fremont, California, June 2009. Chapter 55 of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. Chapter 55 The Great Reaction. They tried to assure the world an era of undisturbed peace by suppressing all new ideas. They made the police spy the highest functionary in the state, and soon the prisons of all countries were filled with those who claimed that people have the right to govern themselves as they see fit. To undo the damage done by the great Napoleonic flood was almost impossible. Age-old fences had been washed away. The palaces of two score dynasties had been damaged to such an extent that they had to be condemned as uninhabitable. Other royal residences had been greatly enlarged at the expense of less fortunate neighbors. Strange odds and ends of revolutionary doctrine had been left behind by the receding waters, and could not be dislodged without danger to the entire community. But the political engineers of the Congress did the best they could— and this is what they accomplished. France had disturbed the peace of the world for so many years that people had come to fear that country almost instinctively. The Bourbons, through the mouth of Talleyrand, had promised to be good, but the hundred days had taught Europe what to expect should Napoleon manage to escape for a second time. The Dutch Republic, therefore, was changed into a kingdom, and Belgium, which had not joined the Dutch struggle for independence in the 16th century, and since then had been part of the Habsburg domains, first under Spanish rule, and thereafter under Austrian rule, was made part of this new kingdom of the Netherlands. Nobody wanted this union, either in the Protestant North or in the Catholic South, but no questions were asked. It seemed good for the peace of Europe, and that was the main consideration. Poland had hoped for great things, because a Pole, Prince Adam Tsartoryski, was one of the most intimate friends of Tsar Alexander, and had been his constant adviser during the war, and at the Congress of Vienna. But Poland was made a semi-independent part of Russia, with Alexander as her king. This solution pleased no one, and caused much bitter feeling, and three revolutions. Denmark, which had remained a faithful ally of Napoleon until the end, was severely punished. Seven years before, an English fleet had sailed down the Kattegat, and without a declaration of war or any warning, had bombarded Copenhagen, and had taken away the Danish fleet, lest it be of value to Napoleon. The Congress of Vienna went one step further. It took Norway, which, since the union of Kalmar of the year 1397, had been united with Denmark, away from Denmark, 
and gave it to Charles the Fourth of Sweden, as a reward for his betrayal of Napoleon, who had set him up in the king business. This Swedish king, curiously enough, was a former French general by the name of Bernadotte, who had come to Sweden as one of Napoleon's adjutants, and had been invited to the throne of that good country when the last of the rulers of the house of Holstein Gottorp had died, without leaving either son or daughter. From 1815 until 1844 he ruled his adopted country, the language of which he never learned, with great ability. He was a clever man, and enjoyed the respect of both his Swedish and his Norwegian subjects, but he did not succeed in joining two countries which nature and history had put asunder. The dual Scandinavian state was never a success, and in 1905 Norway, in a most peaceful and orderly manner, set up as an independent kingdom, and the Swedes bade her good speed, and very wisely let her go her own way. The Italians, who since the days of the Renaissance had been at the mercy of a long series of invaders, also had put great hopes in General Bonaparte. The Emperor Napoleon, however, had grievously disappointed them. Instead of the united Italy which the people wanted, they had been divided into a number of little principalities, duchies, republics, and the papal state, which, next to Naples, was the worst governed and most miserable region of the entire peninsula. The Congress of Vienna abolished a few of the Napoleonic republics, and in their place resurrected several old principalities, which were given to deserving members, both male and female, of the Habsburg family. The poor Spaniards, who had started the great nationalistic revolt against Napoleon, and who had sacrificed the best blood of the country for their king, were punished severely when the Congress allowed His Majesty to return to his domains. This vicious creature, known as Ferdinand the Seventh, had spent the last four years of his life as a prisoner of Napoleon. He had improved his days by knitting garments for the statues of his favourite patron saints. He celebrated his return by reintroducing the Inquisition and the torture chamber, both of which had been abolished by the Revolution. He was a disgusting person, despised as much by his subjects as by his four wives, but the Holy Alliance maintained him upon his legitimate throne, and all efforts of the decent Spaniards to get rid of this curse and make Spain a constitutional kingdom ended in bloodshed and executions. Portugal had been without a king since the year 1807, when the royal family had fled to the colonies in Brazil. The country had been used as a base of supply for the armies of Wellington during the Peninsula War, which lasted from 1808 until 1814. After 1815, Portugal continued to be a sort of British province until the house of Braganza returned to the throne, leaving one of its members behind in Rio de Janeiro as Emperor of Brazil, the only American empire which lasted for more than a few years, and which came to an end in 1889, when the country became a republic. In the East, nothing was done to improve the terrible conditions of both the Slavs and the Greeks, who were still subjects of the Sultan. In the year 1804, Black George, a Servian swineherd, the founder of the Karagiorgevich dynasty, had started a revolt against the Turks, but he had been defeated by his enemies, and had been murdered by one of his supposed friends, the rival Servian leader called Milos Obrenovich, who became the founder of the Obrenovich dynasty, and the Turks had continued to be the undisputed masters of the Balkans. The Greeks, who, since the loss of their independence two thousand years before, had been the subjects of the Macedonians, the Romans, the Venetians, and the Turks, had hoped that their countrymen, Capo de Istria, a native of Corfu, and together with Tsar Tariski, the most intimate personal friends of Alexander, would do something for them. But the Congress of Vienna was not interested in Greeks, but was very much interested in keeping all legitimate monarchs, Christian, Muslim, and otherwise, upon their respective thrones. Therefore, nothing was done. The last, but perhaps the greatest, blunder of the Congress was the treatment of Germany. The Reformation and the Thirty Years' War had not only destroyed the prosperity of the country, but had turned it into a hopeless political rubbish heap, consisting of a couple of kingdoms, a few grand duchies, a large number of duchies, and hundreds of margravates, principalities, baronies, electorates, free cities, and free villages, 
ruled by the strangest assortment of potentates that was ever seen off the comic opera stage. Frederick the Great had changed this when he created a strong Prussia, but this state had not survived him by many years. Napoleon had blue-penciled the demand for independence of most of these little countries, and only fifty-two out of a total of more than three hundred had survived the year 1806. During the years of the great struggle for independence, many a young soldier had dreamed of a new fatherland that should be strong and united. But there can be no union without a strong leadership, and who was to be this leader? There were five kingdoms in the German-speaking lands. The rulers of two of these, Austria and Prussia, were kings by the grace of God. The rulers of three others, Bavaria, Saxony, and Württemberg, were kings by the grace of Napoleon, and as they had been the faithful henchmen of the emperor, their patriotic credit with the other Germans was therefore not very good. The Congress had established a new German confederation, a league of thirty-eight sovereign states, under the chairmanship of the King of Austria, who was now known as the Emperor of Austria. It was the sort of makeshift arrangement which satisfied no one. It is true that a German diet, which met in the old coronation city of Frankfurt, had been created to discuss matters of common policy and importance. But in this diet, thirty-eight delegates represented thirty-eight different interests, and as no decision could be taken without a unanimous vote, a parliamentary rule which had in previous centuries ruined the mighty kingdom of Poland, the famous German confederation became very soon the laughing-stock of Europe. And the politics of the old empire began to resemble those of our Central American neighbors in the forties and the fifties of the last century. It was terribly humiliating to the people who had sacrificed everything for a national ideal. But the Congress was not interested in the private feelings of subjects, and the debate was closed. Did anybody object? Most assuredly. As soon as the first feeling of hatred against Napoleon had quieted down, as soon as the enthusiasm of the Great War had subsided, as soon as the people came to a full realization of the crime that had been committed in the name of peace and stability, they began to murmur. They even made threats of open revolt. But what could they do? They were powerless. They were at the mercy of the most pitiless and efficient police system the world had ever seen. The members of the Congress of Vienna honestly and sincerely believed that the revolutionary principle had led to the criminal usurpation of the throne by the former Emperor Napoleon. They felt that they were called upon to eradicate the adherents of the so-called French ideas, just as Philip II had only followed the voice of his conscience when he burned Protestants or hanged Moors. In the beginning of the sixteenth century, a man who did not believe in the divine right of the Pope to rule his subjects as he saw fit was a heretic, and it was the duty of all loyal citizens to kill him. In the beginning of the nineteenth century, on the continent of Europe, a man who did not believe in the divine right of his king to rule him as he or his prime minister saw fit was a heretic, and it was the duty of all loyal citizens to denounce him to the nearest policeman and see that he got punished. But the rulers of the year 1815 had learned efficiency in the school of Napoleon, and they performed their task much better than it had been done in the year 1517. The period between the year 1815 and the year 1860 was the great era of the political spy. Spies were everywhere. They lived in palaces, and they were to be found in the lowest gin shops. They peeped through the keyholes of the ministerial cabinet, and they listened to the conversations of the people who were taking the air on the benches of the municipal park. They guarded the frontier so that no one might leave without a duly visaed passport, and they inspected all packages, that no books with dangerous French ideas should enter the realm of their royal masters. They sat among the students in the lecture hall, and woe to the professor who uttered a word against the existing order of things. They followed little boys and girls on their way to church, lest they play hooky. In many of these tasks they were assisted by the clergy. The church had suffered greatly during the days of the Revolution. The church property had been confiscated. Several priests had been killed, and the generation that had learned its catechism from Voltaire and Rousseau 
and the other French philosophers, had danced around the altar of reason when the Committee of Public Safety had abolished the worship of God in October of the year 1793. The priests had followed the émigrés into their long exile. Now they returned in the wake of the Allied armies, and they set to work with a vengeance. Even the Jesuits came back in 1814, and resumed their former labors of educating the young. Their order had been a little too successful in its fight against the enemies of the church. It had established provinces in every part of the world to teach the natives the blessings of Christianity, but soon it had developed into a regular trading company which was forever interfering with the civil authorities. During the reign of the Marquis de Pombal, the great reforming minister of Portugal, they had been driven out of the Portuguese lands, and in the year 1773, at the request of most of the Catholic powers of Europe, the order had been suppressed by Pope Clement the Ninth. Now they were back on the job, and preached the principles of obedience and love for the legitimate dynasty to children whose parents had hired shop windows that they might laugh at Marie Antoinette driving to the scaffold, which was to end her misery. But in the Protestant countries like Prussia, things were not a whit better. The great patriotic leaders of the year 1812, the poets and the writers who had preached a holy war upon the usurper, were now branded as dangerous demagogues. Their houses were searched, their letters were read, they were obliged to report to the police at regular intervals, and give an account of themselves. The Prussian drill-master was let loose in all his fury upon the younger generation. When a party of students celebrated the tercentenary of the Reformation with noisy but harmless festivities on the old Wartburg, the Prussian bureaucrats had visions of an imminent revolution. When a theological student, more honest than intelligent, killed a Russian government spy who was operating in Germany, the universities were placed under police supervision, and professors were jailed or dismissed without any form of trial. Russia, of course, was even more absurd in these anti-revolutionary activities. Alexander had recovered from his attack of piety. He was gradually drifting toward melancholia. He well knew his own limited abilities, and understood how at Vienna he had been the victim both of Metternich and the Krudener woman. More and more he turned his back upon the West, and became a truly Russian ruler, whose interests lay in Constantinople, the old holy city that had been the first teacher of the Slavs. The older he grew, the harder he worked, and the less he was able to accomplish. And while he sat in his study, his ministers turned the whole of Russia into a land of military barracks. It is not a pretty picture. Perhaps I might have shortened this description of the great reaction, but it is just as well that you should have a thorough knowledge of this era. It was not the first time that an attempt had been made to set the clock of history back. The result was the usual one. End of chapter 55 Read on June 1st, 2009 in San Diego, California Chapter 56 of The Story of Mankind This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loan. Chapter 56. National Independence. The love of national independence, however, was too strong to be destroyed in this way. The South Americans were the first to rebel against the reactionary measures of the Congress of Vienna, Greece, and Belgium, and Spain, and a large number of other countries of the European continent followed suit, and the 19th century was filled with the rumor of many wars of independence. It will serve no good purpose to say, if only the Congress of Vienna had done such and such a thing instead of taking such and such a course, the history of Europe in the 19th century would have been different. The Congress of Vienna was a gathering of men who had just passed through a great revolution and through twenty years of terrible and almost continuous warfare. They came together for the purpose of giving Europe that peace and stability which they thought that the people needed and wanted. They were what we call reactionaries. They sincerely believed in the inability of the mass of the people to rule themselves. 
they rearranged the map of Europe in such a way as seemed to promise the greatest possibility of a lasting success. They failed, but not through any premeditated wickedness on their part. They were, for the greater part, men of the old school, who remembered the happier days of their quiet youth, and ardently wished a return of that blessed period. They failed to recognize the strong hold which many of the revolutionary principles had gained upon the people of the European continent. That was a misfortune, but hardly a sin. But one of the things which the French Revolution had taught not only Europe, but America as well, was the right of people to their own nationality. Napoleon, who respected nothing and nobody, was utterly ruthless in his dealing with national and patriotic aspirations. But the early revolutionary generals had proclaimed the new doctrine that nationality was not a matter of political frontiers or round skulls and broad noses, but a matter of the heart and soul. While they were teaching the French children the greatness of the French nation, they encouraged Spaniards and Hollanders and Italians to do the same thing. Soon these people, who all shared Rousseau's belief in the superior virtues of original man, began to dig into their past and found, buried beneath the ruins of the feudal system, the bones of the mighty races of which they supposed themselves the feeble descendants. The first half of the nineteenth century was the era of the great historical discoveries. Everywhere historians were busy publishing medieval charters and early medieval chronicles, and in every country the result was a new pride in the old fatherland. A great deal of this sentiment was based upon the wrong interpretation of historical facts. But, in practical politics, it does not matter what is true, but everything depends upon what the people believe to be true. And in most countries, both the kings and their subjects firmly believed in the glory and fame of their ancestors. The Congress of Vienna was not inclined to be sentimental. Their excellencies divided the map of Europe according to the best interests of half a dozen dynasties, and put national aspirations upon the index, or list of forbidden books, together with all other dangerous French doctrines. But history is no respecter of Congress. For some reason or other, it may be an historical law, which thus far has escaped the attention of the scholars, nations seem to be necessary for the orderly development of human society, and the attempt to stem this tide was quite as unsuccessful as the Metternichian effort to prevent people from thinking. Curiously enough, the first trouble began in a very distant part of the world, in South America. The Spanish colonies of that continent had been enjoying a period of relative independence during the many years of the great Napoleonic Wars. They had even remained faithful to their king when he was taken prisoner by the French emperor, and they had refused to recognize Joseph Bonaparte, who had in the year 1808 been made king of Spain by order of his brother. Indeed, the only part of America to get very much upset by the revolution was the island of Haiti, the Española of Columbus's first trip. Here in the year 1791, the French Convention, in a sudden outburst of love and human brotherhood, had bestowed upon their black brethren all the privileges hitherto enjoyed by their white masters. Just as suddenly, they had repented of this step, but the attempt to undo the original promise led to many years of terrible warfare between General Leclerc, the brother-in-law of Napoleon, and Toussaint Louverture, the Negro chieftain. In the year 1801, Toussaint was asked to visit Leclerc and discuss terms of peace. He received the solemn promise that he would not be molested. He trusted his white adversaries, was put on board a ship, and shortly afterwards died in a French prison. But the Negroes gained their independence all the same and founded a republic. Incidentally, they were of great help to the first great South American patriot in his efforts to deliver his native country from the Spanish yoke. Simon Bolivar, a native of Caracas in Venezuela, was born in the year 1783, had been educated in Spain, had visited Paris, where he had seen the revolutionary government at work, had lived for a while in the United States, and had returned to his native land, where the widespread discontent against Spain, the mother country, was beginning to take a definite form. In the year 1811, Venezuela declared its independence, and Bolivar became one of the revolutionary generals. Within two months, the rebels were defeated and Bolivar fled. For the next five years, he was the leader of an apparently lost cause. 
he sacrificed all his wealth, and he would not have been able to begin his final and successful expedition without the support of the President of Haiti. Thereafter, the revolt spread all over South America, and soon it appeared that Spain was not able to suppress the rebellion unaided. She asked for the support of the Holy Alliance. This step greatly worried England. The British shippers had succeeded the Dutch as the common carriers of the world, and they expected to reap heavy profits from a declaration of independence on the part of all South America. They had hopes that the United States of America would interfere, but the Senate had no such plans, and in the House, too, there were many voices which declared that Spain ought to be given a free hand. Just then there was a change of ministers in England. The Whigs went out and the Tories came in. George Canning became Secretary of State. He dropped a hint that England would gladly back up the American government with all the might of her fleet, if said government would declare its disapproval of the plans of the Holy Alliance in regard to the rebellious colonies of the southern continent. President Monroe, thereupon, on the 2nd of December of the year 1823, addressed Congress and stated that America would consider any attempt on the part of the Allied powers to extend their system to any portion of this western hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety, and gave warning that the American government would consider such action on the part of the Holy Alliance as a manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. Four weeks later, the text of the Monroe Doctrine was printed in the English newspapers, and the members of the Holy Alliance were forced to make their choice. Here you see a picture of the continents of North America and South America surrounded by a barbed wire fence, and posted a sign that says, Special Notice, All guests are welcome, but they must not bring their guns. It's titled The Monroe Doctrine. Metternich hesitated. Personally, he would have been willing to risk the displeasure of the United States, which had allowed both its army and navy to fall into neglect since the end of the Anglo-American War of the year 1812. But Canning's threatening attitude and trouble on the continent forced him to be careful. The expedition never took place, and South America and Mexico gained their independence. As for the troubles on the continent of Europe, they were coming fast and furious. The Holy Alliance had sent French troops to Spain to act as guardians of the peace in the year 1820. Austrian troops had been used for a similar purpose in Italy when the Carbonari, the secret society of the charcoal burners, were making propaganda for a united Italy and had caused a rebellion against the unspeakable Ferdinand of Naples. Bad news also came from Russia, where the death of Alexander had been the sign for a revolutionary outbreak in St. Petersburg, a short but bloody upheaval, the so-called Decabrist Revolt, because it took place in December, which ended with the hanging of a large number of good patriots, who had been disgusted by the reaction of Alexander's last years, and had tried to give Russia a constitutional form of government. But worse was to follow. Metternich had tried to assure himself of the continued support of the European courts by a series of conferences at Aix-la-Chapelle, at Tripol, at Leibach, and finally at Verona. The delegates from the different powers duly traveled to these agreeable watering places, where the Austrian Prime Minister used to spend his summers. They always promised to do their best to suppress revolt, but they were none too certain of their success. The spirit of the people was beginning to be ugly, and especially in France the position of the king was by no means satisfactory. The real trouble, however, began in the Balkans, the gateway to Western Europe, through which the invaders of that continent had passed since the beginning of time. The first outbreak was in Moldavia, the ancient Roman province of Dacia, which had been cut off from the empire in the third century. Since then, it had been a lost land, a sort of Atlantis, where the people had continued to speak the old Roman tongue, and still called themselves Romans, and their country Romania. Here, in the year 1821, a young Greek, Prince Alexander Ypsilanti, began a revolt against the Turks. He told his followers that they could count upon the support of Russia, but Metternich's fast couriers were soon on their way to St. Petersburg and the Tsar, entirely persuaded by the Austrian arguments in favor of peace and stability, refused to help. Ypsilanti was forced to flee to Austria, where he spent the next seven years in prison. In the same year, 1821, trouble began in Greece. Since 1815, a secret society of Greek patriots had been preparing the way for a revolt. 
Suddenly they hoisted the flag of independence in the Moria, the ancient Peloponnesus, and drove the Turkish garrisons away. The Turks answered in the usual fashion. They took the Greek patriarch of Constantinople, who was regarded as their pope both by the Greeks and by many Russians, and they hanged him on Easter Sunday of the year 1821, together with a number of his bishops. The Greeks came back with a massacre of all the Mohammedans in Tripolitza, the capital of the Moria, and the Turks retaliated by an attack upon the island of Chios, where they murdered 25,000 Christians and sold 45,000 others as slaves into Asia and Egypt. Then the Greeks appealed to the European courts, but Metternich told them in so many words that they could stew in their own Greece. I am not trying to make a pun, but I am quoting His Serene Highness, who informed the Tsar that this fire of revolt ought to burn itself out beyond the pale of civilization. And the frontiers were closed to those volunteers who wished to go to the rescue of the patriotic Hellenes. Their cause seemed lost. At the request of Turkey, an Egyptian army was landed in the Moria, and soon the Turkish flag was again flying from the Acropolis, the ancient stronghold of Athens. The Egyptian army then pacified the country, a la Turk, and Metternich followed the proceedings with quiet interest, awaiting the day when this attempt against the peace of Europe should be a thing of the past. Once more, it was England which upset his plans. The greatest glory of England does not lie in her vast colonial possessions, in her wealth, or her navy, but in the quiet heroism and independence of her average citizen. The Englishman obeys the laws because he knows that respect for the rights of others marks the difference between a dog kennel and a civilized society. But he does not recognize the right of others to interfere with his freedom of thought. If his country does something which he believes to be wrong, he gets up and says so, and the government which he attacks will respect him and will give him full protection against the mob, which today, as in the time of Socrates, often loves to destroy those who surpass it in courage or intelligence. There never has been a good cause, however unpopular or however distant, which has not counted a number of Englishmen among its staunchest adherents. The mass of the English people are not different from those in other lands. They stick to the business at hand, and have no time for unpractical sporting ventures. But they rather admire their eccentric neighbor, who drops everything to go and fight for some obscure people in Asia or Africa and when he has been killed they give him a fine public funeral and hold him up to their children as an example of valor and chivalry even the police spies of the holy alliance were powerless against this national characteristic in the year eighteen twenty four lord byron a rich young englishman who wrote the poetry over which all europe wept hoisted the sails of his yacht and started south to help the greeks three months later the news spread through europe that their hero lay dead in missolonghi the last of the Greek strongholds. His lonely death caught the imagination of the people. In all countries, societies were formed to help the Greeks. Lafayette, the grand old man of the American Revolution, pleaded their cause in France. The king of Bavaria sent hundreds of his officers. Money and supplies poured in upon the starving men of Missolonghi. In England, George Canning, who had defeated the plans of the Holy Alliance in South America, was now prime minister. He saw his chance to checkmate Metternich for a second time. The English and Russian fleets were already in the Mediterranean. They were sent by governments, which dared no longer suppress the popular enthusiasm for the cause of the Greek patriots. The French navy appeared because France, since the end of the Crusades, had assumed the role of the defender of the Christian faith in Mohammedan lands. On October 20th of the year 1827, the ships of the three nations attacked the Turkish fleet in the Bay of Navarino and destroyed it. Rarely has the news of a battle been received with such general rejoicing. The people of Western Europe and Russia, who enjoyed no freedom at home, consoled themselves by fighting an imaginary war of liberty on behalf of the oppressed Greeks. In the year 1829 they had their reward. Greece became an independent nation, and the policy of reaction and stability suffered its second great defeat. It would be absurd were I to try in this short volume to give you a detailed account of the struggle for national independence in all other countries. There are a large number of excellent books devoted to such subjects. I have described the struggle for the independence of Greece because it was the first successful attack upon the bulwark of reaction which the Congress of Vienna had erected to maintain the stability of Europe. 
that mighty fortress of suppression still held out, and Metternich continued to be in command, but the end was near. In France, the Bourbons had established an almost unbearable rule of police officials who were trying to undo the work of the French Revolution with an absolute disregard of the regulations and laws of civilized warfare. When Louis the Eighteenth died in the year 1824, the people had enjoyed nine years of peace, which had proved even more unhappy than the ten years of war of the empire. Louis was succeeded by his brother, Charles X. Louis had belonged to that famous Bourbon family which, although it never learned anything, never forgot anything. The recollection of that morning in the town of Ham, when news had reached him of the decapitation of his brother, remained a constant warning of what might happen to those kings who did not read the signs of the times aright. Charles, on the other hand, who had managed to run up private debts of fifty million francs before he was twenty years of age, knew nothing, remembered nothing, and firmly intended to learn nothing. As soon as he had succeeded his brother, he established a government by priests, through priests, and for priests. And while the Duke of Wellington, who made this remark, cannot be called a violent liberal, Charles ruled in such a way that he disgusted even that trusted friend of law and order. When he tried to suppress the newspapers which dared to criticize his government, and dismiss the Parliament because it supported the press, his days were numbered. On the night of the 27th of July of the year 1830, a revolution took place in Paris. On the 30th of the same month, the king fled to the coast and set sail for England. In this way, the famous farce of fifteen years came to an end, and the Bourbons were at last removed from the throne of France. They were too hopelessly incompetent. France then might have returned to a republican form of government, but such a step would not have been tolerated by Metternich. The situation was dangerous enough. The spark of rebellion had leaped beyond the French frontier, and had set fire to another powder-house filled with national grievances. The new kingdom of the Netherlands had not been a success. The Belgian and the Dutch people had nothing in common, and their king, William of Orange, the descendant of an uncle of William the Silent, while a hard worker and a good business man, was too much lacking in tact and pliability to keep the peace among his uncongenial subjects. Besides, the horde of priests which had descended upon France had at once found its way into Belgium, and whatever Protestant William tried to do was howled down by a large crowd of excited citizens as a fresh attempt upon the freedom of the Catholic Church. On the 25th of August, there was a popular outbreak against the Dutch authorities in Brussels, Two months later, the Belgians declared themselves independent and elected Leopold of Coburg, the uncle of Queen Victoria of England, to the throne. That was an excellent solution of the difficulty. The two countries, which never ought to have been united, parted their ways and thereafter lived in peace and harmony and behaved like decent neighbors. News in those days, when there were only a few short railroads, traveled slowly, but when the success of the French and the Belgian revolutionists became known in Poland, there was an immediate clash between the Poles and their Russian rulers, which led to a year of terrible warfare, and ended with a complete victory for the Russians, who established order along the banks of the Vistula, in the well-known Russian fashion. Nicholas I, who had succeeded his brother Alexander in 1825, firmly believed in the divine right of his own family, and the thousands of Polish refugees, who had found shelter in Western Europe, bore witness to the fact that the principles of the Holy Alliance were still more than a hollow phrase in Holy Russia. In Italy, too, there was a moment of unrest. Marie-Louise, Duchess of Parma, and wife of the former Emperor Napoleon, whom she had deserted after the defeat of Waterloo, was driven away from her country, and in the Papal State, the exasperated people tried to establish an independent republic. But the armies of Austria marched to Rome, and soon everything was as of old. Metternich continued to reside at the Baal Platz, the home of the foreign minister of the Habsburg dynasty. The police spies returned to their job, and peace reigned supreme. Eighteen more years were to pass before a second and more successful attempt could be made to deliver Europe from the terrible inheritance of the Vienna Congress. Again it was France, the revolutionary weathercock of Europe, which gave the signal of revolt, Charles X had been succeeded by Louis Philippe, the son of that famous Duke of Orleans who had turned Jacobin, had voted for the death of his cousin the king, and had played a role during the early days of the revolution under the name 
of Philip Egalité, or Equality Philip. Eventually, he had been killed when Robespierre tried to purge the nation of all traitors, by which name he indicated those people who did not share his own views, and his son had been forced to run away from the revolutionary army. Young Louis Philippe thereupon had wandered far and wide. He had taught school in Switzerland, and had spent a couple of years exploring the unknown far west of America. After the fall of Napoleon, he had returned to Paris. He was much more intelligent than his Bourbon cousins. He was a simple man who went about in the public parks with a red cotton umbrella under his arm, followed by a brood of children like any good house-father. But France had outgrown the king business, and Louis did not know this until the morning of the 24th of February of the year 1848, when a crowd stormed the Tuileries and drove His Majesty away and proclaimed the Republic. When the news of this event reached Vienna, Metternich expressed the casual opinion that this was only a repetition of the year 1793, and that the Allies would once more be obliged to march upon Paris and make an end to this very unseemly democratic row. But two weeks later, his own Austrian capital was in open revolt. Metternich escaped from the mob through the back door of his palace, and the Emperor Ferdinand was forced to give his subjects a constitution which embodied most of the revolutionary principles which his Prime Minister had tried to suppress for the last thirty-three years. This time all Europe felt the shock. Hungary declared itself independent, and commenced a war against the Habsburgs, under the leadership of Louis Kossuth. The unequal struggle lasted more than a year. It was finally suppressed by the armies of Tsar Nicholas, who marched across the Carpathian Mountains, and made Hungary once more safe for autocracy. The Habsburgs thereupon established extraordinary courts martial and hanged the greater part of the Hungarian patriots, whom they had not been able to defeat in open battle. As for Italy, the island of Sicily declared itself independent from Naples and drove its Bourbon king away. In the Papal States, the Prime Minister, Rossi, was murdered and the Pope was forced to flee. He returned the next year at the head of a French army, which remained in Europe to protect His Holiness against his subjects, until the year 1870. Then it was called back to defend France against the Prussians, and Rome became the capital of Italy. In the north, Milan and Venice rose against their Austrian masters. They were supported by King Albert of Sardinia, but a strong Austrian army under old Radetzky marched into the valley of the Po, defeated the Sardinians near Costoza and Novara, and forced Albert to abdicate in favor of his son, Victor Emmanuel who, a few years later, was to be the first king of United Italy. In Germany, the unrest of the year 1848 took the form of a great national demonstration in favor of political unity and a representative form of government. In Bavaria, the king, who had wasted his time and money upon an Irish lady who posed as a Spanish dancer, she was called Lola Montez and lies buried in New York's Potter's Field, was driven away by the enraged students of the university. In Prussia, the king was forced to stand with uncovered head before the coffins of those who had been killed during the street fighting, and to promise a constitutional form of government. And in March of the year 1849, a German parliament, consisting of 550 delegates from all parts of the country, came together in Frankfurt, and proposed that King Frederick William of Prussia should be the emperor of a united Germany. Then, however, the tide began to turn. Incompetent Ferdinand had abdicated in favor of his nephew Francis Joseph. The well-drilled Austrian army had remained faithful to their warlord. The hangman was given plenty of work, and the Habsburgs, after the nature of that strangely cat-like family, once more landed upon their feet and rapidly strengthened their position as the masters of Eastern and Western Europe. They played the game of politics very adroitly, and used the jealousies of the other German states to prevent the elevation of the Prussian king to the imperial dignity. Their long training in the art of suffering defeat had taught them the value of patience. They knew how to wait. They bided their time, and while the liberals, utterly untrained in practical politics, talked and talked and talked and got intoxicated by their own fine speeches, the Austrians quietly gathered their forces, dismissed the Parliament of Frankfurt, and re-established the old and impossible German Confederation, which the Congress of Vienna had wished upon an unsuspecting world. But among the men who had attended this strange parliament of unpractical enthusiasts, there was a Prussian country squire by the name of Bismarck, 
who had made good use of his eyes and ears. He had a deep contempt for oratory. He knew what every man of action has always known, that nothing is ever accomplished by talk. In his own way, he was a sincere patriot. He had been trained in the old school of diplomacy, and he could outlie his opponents just as he could outwalk them and outdrink them and outride them. Bismarck felt convinced that the loose confederation of little states must be changed into a strong united country if it would hold its own against the other European powers. Brought up amidst feudal ideas of loyalty, he decided that the house of Hohenzollern, of which he was the most faithful servant, should rule the new state, rather than the incompetent Habsburgs. For this purpose, he must first get rid of the Austrian influence, and he began to make the necessary preparations for this painful operation. Italy, in the meantime, had solved her own problem, and had rid herself of her hated Austrian master. The unity of Italy was the work of three men, Cavour, Mazzini, and Garibaldi. Of these three, Cavour, the civil engineer, with the short-sighted eyes and the steel-rimmed glasses, played the part of the careful political pilot. Mazzini, who had spent most of his days in different European garrets, hiding from the Austrian police, was the public agitator, while Garibaldi, with his band of red-shirted rough riders, appealed to the popular imagination. Mazzini and Garibaldi were both believers in the republican form of government. Cavour, however, was a monarchist, and the others who recognized his superior ability in such matters of practical statecraft accepted his decision and sacrificed their own ambitions for the greater good of their beloved fatherland. Here you see a picture of a small jail cell with Giuseppe Mazzini sitting inside. Cavour felt towards the house of Sardinia, as Bismarck did towards the Hohenzollern family. With infinite care and great shrewdness, he set to work to jockey the Sardinian king into a position from which his majesty would be able to assume the leadership of the entire Italian people. The unsettled political conditions in the rest of Europe greatly helped him in his plans, and no country contributed more to the independence of Italy than her old and trusted, and often distrusted, neighbor, France. In that turbulent country, in November of the year 1852, the Republic had come to a sudden but not unexpected end. Napoleon III, the son of Louis Bonaparte and the former King of Holland, and the small nephew of a great uncle, had re-established an empire, and had made himself emperor by the grace of God and the will of the people. This young man, who had been educated in Germany, and who mixed his French with harsh Teutonic gutturals, just as the first Napoleon had always spoken the language of his adopted country with a strong Italian accent, was trying very hard to use the Napoleonic tradition for his own benefit. But he had many enemies, and did not feel very certain of his hold upon his ready-made throne. He had gained the friendship of Queen Victoria, but this had not been a difficult task, as the good queen was not particularly brilliant, and was very susceptible to flattery. As for the other European sovereigns, they treated the French emperor with insulting haughtiness, and sat up nights devising new ways in which they could show their upstart good brother how sincerely they despised him. Napoleon was obliged to find a way in which he could break this opposition, either through love or through fear. He well knew the fascination which the word glory still held for his subjects. Since he was forced to gamble for his throne, he decided to play the game of empire for high stakes. He used an attack of Russia upon Turkey as an excuse for bringing about the Crimean War, in which England and France combined against the Tsar on behalf of the Sultan. It was a very costly and exceedingly unprofitable enterprise. Neither France nor England nor Russia reaped much glory. But the Crimean War did one good thing. It gave Sardinia a chance to volunteer on the winning side, and when peace was declared, it gave Cavour the opportunity to lay claim to the gratitude of both England and France. Having made use of the international situation to get Sardinia recognized as one of the more important powers of Europe, the clever Italian then provoked a war between Sardinia and Austria in June of the year 1859. He assured himself of the support of Napoleon in exchange for the provinces of Savoy and the city of Nice, which was really an Italian town. The Franco-Italian armies defeated the Austrians at Magenta and Solferino, and the former Austrian provinces and duchies were united into a single Italian kingdom. Florence became the capital of this new Italy, 
until the year 1870, when the French recalled their troops from Rome to defend France against the Germans. As soon as they were gone, the Italian troops entered the Eternal City, and the House of Sardinia took up its residence in the old palace of the Quirinal, which an ancient pope had built on the ruins of the baths of the Emperor Constantine. The pope, however, moved across the river Tiber, and hid behind the walls of the Vatican, which had been the home of many of his predecessors since their return from the exile of Avignon in the year 1377. He protested loudly against this high-handed theft of his domains, and addressed letters of appeal to those faithful Catholics who were inclined to sympathize with him in his loss. Their number, however, was small, and it had been steadily decreasing. For, once delivered from the cares of state, the Pope was able to devote all his time to questions of a spiritual nature. Standing high above the petty quarrels of the European politicians, the papacy assumed a new dignity, which proved of great benefit to the Church, and made it an international power for social and religious progress, which has shown a much more intelligent appreciation of modern economic problems than most Protestant sects. In this way, the attempt of the Congress of Vienna to settle the Italian question by making the peninsula an Austrian province was at last undone. The German problem, however, remained as yet unsolved. It proved the most difficult of all. The failure of the revolution of the year 1848 had led to the wholesale migration of the more energetic and liberal elements among the German people. These young fellows had moved to the United States of America, to Brazil, to the new colonies in Asia and America. Their work was continued in Germany, but by a different sort of men. In the new diet, which met at Frankfurt, after the collapse of the German Parliament and the failure of the liberals to establish a united country, the Kingdom of Prussia was represented by that same Otto von Bismarck from whom we parted a few pages ago. Bismarck by now had managed to gain the complete confidence of the King of Prussia. That was all he asked for. The opinion of the Prussian Parliament, or of the Prussian people, interested him not at all. With his own eyes, he had seen the defeat of the Liberals. He knew that he would not be able to get rid of Austria without a war, and he began by strengthening the Prussian army. The Landtag, exasperated at his high-handed methods, refused to give him the necessary credits. Bismarck did not even bother to discuss the matter. He went ahead and increased his army with the help of funds which the Prussian House of Peers and the King placed at his disposal. Then he looked for a national cause which could be used for the purpose of creating a great wave of patriotism among all the German people. In the north of Germany there were the Dukies of Schleswig and Holstein, which ever since the Middle Ages had been a source of trouble. Both countries were inhabited by a certain number of Danes and a certain number of Germans, but, although they were governed by the King of Denmark, they were not an integral part of the Danish state, and this led to endless difficulties. Heaven forbid that I should revive this forgotten question, which now seems settled by the acts of the recent Congress of Versailles. But the Germans in Holstein were very loud in their abuse of the Danes, and the Danes in Schleswig made great ado of their Danishness, and all Europe was discussing the problem, and German Manorshores and Turnverains listened to sentimental speeches about the lost brethren, and the different chancelleries were trying to discover what it was all about, when Prussia mobilized her armies to save the lost provinces. As Austria, the official head of the German Confederation, could not allow Prussia to act alone in such an important matter, the Habsburg troops were mobilized too, and the combined armies of the two great powers crossed the Danish frontiers, and after a very brave resistance on the part of the Danes, occupied the two dukies. The Danes appealed to Europe, but Europe was otherwise engaged, and the poor Danes were left to their fate. Bismarck prepared the scene for the second number upon his imperial program. He used the division of the spoils to pick a quarrel with Austria. The Habsburgs fell into the trap. The new Prussian army, the creation of Bismarck and his faithful generals, invaded Bohemia, and in less than six weeks the last of the Austrian troops had been destroyed at Koniggratz and Sadawa, and the road to Vienna lay open. But Bismarck did not want to go too far. He knew that he would need a few friends in Europe. He offered the defeated Habsburgs very decent terms of peace, provided they would resign their chairmanship of the Confederation. He was less merciful to many of the smaller German states who had taken the side of the Austrians and annexed them to Prussia. 
the greater part of the northern states then formed a new organization, the so-called Northern German Confederacy, and victorious Prussia assumed the unofficial leadership of the German people. Europe stood aghast at the rapidity with which the work of consolidation had been done. England was quite indifferent, but France showed signs of disapproval. Napoleon's hold upon the French people was steadily diminishing. The Crimean War had been costly and had accomplished nothing. A second adventure in the year 1863, when a French army had tried to force an Austrian Grand Duke by the name of Maximilian upon the Mexican people as their emperor, had come to a disastrous end as soon as the American Civil War had been won by the North. For the government at Washington had forced the French to withdraw their troops, and this had given the Mexicans a chance to clear their country of the enemy and shoot the unwelcome emperor. It was necessary to give the Napoleonic throne a new coat of glory paint. Within a few years, the North German Confederation would be a serious rival of France. Napoleon decided that a war with Germany would be a good thing for his dynasty. He looked for an excuse, and Spain, the poor victim of endless revolutions, gave him one. Just then, the Spanish throne happened to be vacant. It had been offered to the Catholic branch of the House of Hohenzollern. The French government had objected, and the Hohenzollerns had politely refused to accept the crown. But Napoleon, who was showing signs of illness, was very much under the influence of his beautiful wife, Eugenie de Montijo, the daughter of a Spanish gentleman and the granddaughter of William Kirkpatrick, an American consul at Malaga, where the grapes come from. Eugenie, though shrewd enough, was as badly educated as most Spanish women of that day. She was at the mercy of her spiritual advisers, and these worthy gentlemen felt no love for the Protestant king of Prussia. Be bold, was the advice of the empress to her husband, but she omitted to add the second half of that famous Persian proverb, which admonishes the hero to be bold, but not too bold. Napoleon, convinced of the strength of his army, addressed himself to the king of Prussia, and insisted that the king give him assurances that he would never permit another candidature of a Hohenzollern prince to the Spanish crown. As the Hohenzollerns had just declined the honor, the demand was superfluous, and Bismarck so informed the French government, but Napoleon was not satisfied. It was the year 1870, and King William was taking the waters at Ems. There one day he was approached by the French minister, who tried to reopen the discussion. The king answered very pleasantly that it was a fine day, and that the Spanish question was now closed, and that nothing more remained to be said upon the subject. As a matter of routine, a report of this interview was telegraphed to Bismarck, who handled all foreign affairs. Bismarck edited the dispatch for the benefit of the Prussian and French press. Many people have called him names for doing this. Bismarck, however, could plead the excuse that the doctoring of official news, since time immemorial, had been one of the privileges of all civilized governments. When the edited telegram was printed, the good people in Berlin felt that their old and venerable king, with his nice white whiskers, had been insulted by an arrogant little Frenchman, and the equally good people of Paris flew into a rage, because their perfectly courteous minister had been shown the door by a royal Prussian flunky. And so they both went to war, and in less than two months, Napoleon and the greater part of his army were prisoners of the Germans. The Second Empire had come to an end, and the Third Republic was making ready to defend Paris against the German invaders. Paris held out for five long months. Ten days before the surrender of the city, in the nearby palace of Versailles, built by that same King Louis the Fourteenth, who had been such a dangerous enemy to the Germans, the King of Prussia was publicly proclaimed German Emperor, and a loud booming of guns told the hungry Parisians that a new German empire had taken the place of the old harmless confederation of Teutonic states and statelets. In this rough way, the German question was finally settled. By the end of the year 1871, fifty-six years after the memorable gathering at Vienna, the work of the Congress had been entirely undone. Metternich and Alexander and Talleyrand had tried to give the people of Europe a lasting peace. The methods they had employed had caused endless wars and revolutions, and the feeling of a common brotherhood of the 18th century was followed by an era of exaggerated nationalism which has not yet come to an end. End of chapter 56, recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, June 2009.
Chapter 57 of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. Chapter 57 The Age of the Engine. But while the people of Europe were fighting for their national independence, the world in which they lived had been entirely changed by a series of inventions which had made the clumsy old steam engine of the eighteenth century the most faithful and efficient slave of man. The greatest benefactor of the human race died more than half a million years ago. He was a hairy creature with a low brow and sunken eyes, a heavy jaw and strong tiger-like teeth. He would not have looked well in a gathering of modern scientists, but they would have honoured him as their master. For he had used a stone to break a nut, and a stick to lift up a heavy boulder. He was the inventor of the hammer, and the lever, our first tools, and he did more than any human being who came after him to give man his enormous advantage over the other animals with whom he shares this planet. Ever since, man has tried to make his life easier by the use of a greater number of tools. The first wheel, a round disc made out of an old tree, created as much stir in the communities of 100,000 B.C. as the flying machine did only a few years ago. In Washington the story is told of a director of the patent office, who in the early thirties of the last century suggested that the patent office be abolished, because everything that could possibly be invented had been invented. A similar feeling must have spread through the prehistoric world, when the first sail was hoisted on a raft, and the people were able to move from place to place without rowing, or punting, or pulling from the shore. Indeed, one of the most interesting chapters of history is the effort of man to let someone else, or something else, do his work for him, while he enjoyed his leisure, sitting in the sun, or painting pictures on rocks, or training young wolves and little tigers to behave like peaceful domestic animals. Of course, in the very olden days, it was always possible to enslave a weaker neighbor and force him to do the unpleasant tasks of life. One of the reasons why the Greeks and Romans, who were quite as intelligent as we are, failed to devise more interesting machinery was to be found in the widespread existence of slavery. Why should a great mathematician waste his time upon wires and pulleys and cogs and fill the air with noise and smoke, when he could go to the marketplace and buy all the slaves he needed, at a very small expense. And during the Middle Ages, although slavery had been abolished, and only a mild form of serfdom survived, the guilds discouraged the idea of using machinery, because they thought this would throw a large number of their brethren out of work. Besides, the Middle Ages were not at all interested in producing large quantities of goods. Their tailors and butchers and carpenters worked for the immediate needs of the small community in which they lived, and had no desire to compete with their neighbors, or to produce more than was strictly necessary. During the Renaissance, when the prejudices of the Church against scientific investigations could no longer be enforced as rigidly as before, a large number of men began to devote their lives to mathematics and astronomy and physics and chemistry. Two years before the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, John Napier, a Scotchman, had published his little book, which described the new invention of logarithms. During the war itself, Gottfried Leibniz of Leipzig had perfected the system of infinitesimal calculus. Eight years before the Peace of Westphalia, Newton, the great English natural philosopher, was born, and in that same year Galileo, the Italian astronomer, died. Meanwhile, the Thirty Years' War had destroyed the prosperity of Central Europe, and there was a sudden but very general interest in alchemy, the strange pseudo-science of the Middle Ages, by which people hoped to turn base metals into gold. This proved to be impossible, but the alchemists in their laboratories stumbled upon many new ideas, and greatly helped the work of the chemists, who were their successors. The work of all these men provided the world with a solid scientific foundation, upon which it was possible to build even the most complicated of engines, 
and a number of practical men made good use of it. The Middle Ages had used wood for the few bits of necessary machinery, but wood wore out easily. Iron was a much better material, but iron was scarce, except in England. In England, therefore, most of the smelting was done. To smelt iron, huge fires were needed. In the beginning, these fires had been made of wood, but gradually the forests had been used up. Then stone coal, the petrified trees of prehistoric times, was used. But coal, as you know, has to be dug out of the ground, and it has to be transported to the smelting ovens, and the mines have to be kept dry from the ever-invading waters. These were two problems which had to be solved at once. For the time being, horses could still be used to haul the coal wagons, but the pumping question demanded the application of special machinery. Several inventors were busy trying to solve the difficulty. They all knew that steam would have to be used in their new engine. The idea of the steam engine was very old. Hero of Alexandria, who lived in the first century before Christ, had described to us several bits of machinery which were driven by steam. The people of the Renaissance had played with the notion of steam-driven war chariots. The Marquis of Worcester, a contemporary of Newton, in his book of inventions, tells of a steam engine. A little later, in the year 1698, Thomas Savory of London applied for a patent for a pumping engine. At the same time, a Hollander, Christian Huygens, was trying to perfect an engine in which gunpowder was used to cause regular explosions, in much the same way as we use gasoline in our motors. All over Europe, people were busy with the idea. Denis Papin, a Frenchman, friend and assistant of Huygens, was making experiments with steam engines in several countries. He invented a little wagon that was driven by steam and a paddle-wheel boat. But when he tried to take a trip in his vessel, it was confiscated by the authorities on a complaint of the Boatmen's Union, who feared that such a craft would deprive them of their livelihood. Papin finally died in London in great poverty, having wasted all his money on his inventions. But at the time of his death, another mechanical enthusiast, Thomas Newcomen, was working on the problem of a new steam pump. Fifty years later, his engine was improved upon by James Watt, a Glasgow instrument maker. In the year 1777, he gave the world the first steam engine that proved of real practical value. But during the centuries of experiments with a heat engine, the political world had greatly changed. The British people had succeeded the Dutch as the common carriers of the world's trade. They had opened up new colonies. They took the raw materials which the colonies produced to England, and there they turned them into finished products, and then they exported the finished goods to the four corners of the world. During the seventeenth century the people of Georgia and the Carolinas had begun to grow a new shrub which gave a strange sort of woolly substance, the so-called cotton wool. After this had been plucked, it was sent to England, and there the people of Lancashire wove it into cloth. This weaving was done by hand, and in the homes of the workmen. Very soon a number of improvements were made in the process of weaving. In the year 1730, John Kay invented the fly shuttle. In 1770, James Hargreaves got a patent on his spinning jenny. Eli Whitney, an American, invented the cotton gin, which separated the cotton from its seeds, a job which had previously been done by hand at the rate of only a pound a day. Finally, Richard Arkwright and the Reverend Edmund Cartwright invented large weaving machines, which were driven by water power. And then in the 80s of the 18th century, just when the Estates General of France had begun those famous meetings which were to revolutionize the political system of Europe, the engines of Watt were arranged in such a way that they could drive the weaving machines of Arkwright, and this created an economic and social revolution which has changed human relationship in almost every part of the world. As soon as the stationary engine had proved a success, the inventors turned their attention to the problem of propelling boats and carts with the help of a mechanical contrivance. Watt himself designed plans for a steam locomotive, but ere he had perfected his ideas, in the year 1804, 
a locomotive made by Richard Trevithick carried a load of twenty tons at Penny Darren in the Wales mining district. At the same time, an American jeweller and portrait painter by the name of Robert Fulton was in Paris, trying to convince Napoleon that with the use of his submarine boat, the Nautilus, and his steamboat, the French might be able to destroy the naval supremacy of England. Fulton's idea of a steamboat was not original. He had undoubtedly copied it from John Fitch, a mechanical genius of Connecticut whose cleverly constructed steamer had first navigated the Delaware River as early as the year 1787. But Napoleon and his scientific advisers did not believe in the practical possibility of a self-propelled boat, and although the Scotch-built engine of the little craft puffed merrily on the Seine, the great emperor neglected to avail himself of this formidable weapon, which might have given him his revenge for Trafalgar. As for Fulton, he returned to the United States, and, being a practical man of business, he organized a successful steamboat company, together with Robert R. Livingston, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, who was American minister to France when Fulton was in Paris, trying to sell his invention. The first steamer of this new company, the Clermont, which was given a monopoly of all the waters of New York State, equipped with an engine built by Bolton and Watt of Birmingham in England, began a regular service between New York and Albany in the year 1807. As for poor John Fitch, the man who long before anyone else had used the steamboat for commercial purposes, he came to a sad death. Broken in health and empty of purse, he had come to the end of his resources when his fifth boat, which was propelled by means of a screw propeller, had been destroyed. His neighbors jeered at him as they were to laugh a hundred years later, when Professor Langley constructed his funny flying machines. Fitch had hoped to give his country an easy access to the broad rivers of the West, and his countrymen preferred to travel in flat boats or go on foot. In the year 1798, in utter despair and misery, Fitch killed himself by taking poison. But twenty years later, the Savannah, a steamer of 1,850 tons and making six knots an hour, the Mauritania goes just four times as fast, crossed the ocean from Savannah to Liverpool in the record time of twenty-five days. Then there was an end to the derision of the multitude, and in their enthusiasm the people gave the credit for the invention to the wrong man. Six years later, George Stevenson, a Scotchman, who had been building locomotives for the purpose of hauling coal from the mine pit to smelting ovens and cotton factories, built his famous travelling engine, which reduced the price of coal by almost seventy per cent, and which made it possible to establish the first regular passenger service between Manchester and Liverpool, when people were whisked from city to city at the unheard-of speed of fifteen miles per hour. A dozen years later this speed had been increased to twenty miles per hour. At the present time any well-behaved fliver, the direct descendant of the puny little motor-driven machines of Daimler and Levasseur of the eighties of the last century, can do better than these early puffing billies. But while these practically-minded engineers were improving upon their rattling heat engines, a group of pure scientists— men who devote fourteen hours of each day to the study of those theoretical scientific phenomena without which no mechanical progress would be possible, were following a new scent which promised to lead them into the most secret and hidden domains of nature. Two thousand years ago a number of Greek and Roman philosophers, notably Thales of Miletus, and Pliny, who was killed while trying to study the eruption of Vesuvius of the year 79, when Pompeii and Herculaneum were buried beneath the ashes, had noticed the strange antics of bits of straw and of feather, which were held near a piece of amber, which was being rubbed with a bit of wool. The schoolmen of the Middle Ages had not been interested in this mysterious electric power. But immediately after the Renaissance, William Gilbert, the private physician of Queen Elizabeth, wrote his famous treatise on the character and behavior of magnets. During the Thirty Years' War, Otto von Guericke, the burgomaster of Magdeburg, and the inventor of the air-pump, constructed the first electrical machine. 
During the next century, a large number of scientists devoted themselves to the study of electricity. Not less than three professors invented the famous Leyden jar in the year 1795. At the same time, Benjamin Franklin, the most universal genius of America next to Benjamin Thompson, who, after his flight from New Hampshire on account of his pro-British sympathies, became known as Count Rumford, was devoting his attention to the subject. He discovered that lightning and the electric spark were manifestations of the same electric power, and continued his electric studies until the end of his busy and useful life. Then came Volta, with his famous electric pile, and Galvani, and Day, and the Danish professor Hans Christian Ørsted, and Ampere, and Arago, and Faraday, all of them diligent searchers after the true nature of the electric forces. They freely gave their discoveries to the world, and Samuel Morse, who, like Fulton, began his career as an artist, thought that he could use this new electric current to transmit messages from one city to another. He intended to use copper wire and a little machine which he had invented. People laughed at him. Morse, therefore, was obliged to finance his own experiments, and soon he had spent all his money, and then he was very poor, and people laughed even louder. He then asked Congress to help him, and a special committee on commerce promised him their support. But the members of Congress were not at all interested, and Morse had to wait twelve years before he was given a small congressional appropriation. He then built a telegraph between Baltimore and Washington. In the year 1837, he had shown his first successful telegraph in one of the lecture halls of New York University. Finally, on the 24th of May of the year 1844, the first long-distance message was sent from Washington to Baltimore, and today the whole world is covered with telegraph wires, and we can send news from Europe to Asia in a few seconds. Twenty-three years later, Alexander Graham Bell used the electric current for his telephone, and half a century afterwards, Marconi improved upon these ideas by inventing a system of sending messages which did away entirely with the old-fashioned wires. While Morse, the New Englander, was working on his telegraph, Michael Faraday, the Yorkshireman, had constructed his first dynamo. This tiny little machine was completed in the year 1881, when Europe was still trembling as a result of the great July revolutions, which had so severely upset the plans of the Congress of Vienna. The first dynamo grew and grew and grew, and today it provides us with heat and with light, you know, the little incandescent bulbs which Edison, building upon French and English experiments of the forties and fifties, first made in 1878, and with power for all sorts of machines. If I am not mistaken, the electric engine will soon entirely drive out the heat engine, just as in the olden days the more highly organized prehistoric animals drove out their less efficient neighbors. Personally, but I know nothing about machinery, this will make me very happy, for the electric engine, which can be run by water power, is a clean and companionable servant of mankind, but the heat engine, the marvel of the eighteenth century, is a noisy and dirty creature, forever filling the world with ridiculous smokestacks, and with dust and soot, and asking that it be fed with coal, which has to be dug out of mines, at great inconvenience and risk to thousands of people. And if I were a novelist, and not a historian who must stick to facts, and may not use his imagination, I would describe the happy day when the last steam locomotive shall be taken to the Museum of Natural History, to be placed next to the skeleton of the dinosaur, and the pterodactyl, and the other extinct creatures of a bygone age. End of chapter 57, read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on June 1st, 2009 in San Diego, California. Chapter 58 of the Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loon. Chapter 58. 
the social revolution. But the new engines were very expensive, and only people of wealth could afford them. The old carpenter or shoemaker who had been his own master in his little workshop was obliged to hire himself out to the owners of the big mechanical tools, and while he made more money than before, he lost his former independence, and he did not like that. In the olden days, the work of the world had been done by independent workmen, who sat in their own little workshops, in the front of their houses, who owned their own tools, who boxed the ears of their own apprentices, and who, within the limits prescribed by their guilds, conducted their business as it pleased them. They lived simple lives, and were obliged to work very long hours, but they were their own masters. If they got up and saw that it was a fine day to go fishing, they went fishing, and there was no one to say no. But the introduction of machinery changed this. A machine is really nothing but a greatly enlarged tool. A railroad train which carries you at the speed of a mile a minute is in reality a pair of very fast legs, and a steam hammer which flattens heavy plates of iron is just a terrible big fist made of steel. But whereas we can all afford a pair of good legs and a good strong fist, a railroad train and a steam hammer and a cotton factory are very expensive pieces of machinery, and they are not owned by a single man, but usually by a company of people who all contribute a certain sum, and then divide the profits of their railroad or cotton mill according to the amount of money which they have invested. Here you see a picture with two panels called the man power and machine power. At the top it says when the Acropolis was built, a hundred men were needed to move a heavy stone. At the bottom it says nowadays little drops of gasoline do the same work in less time, and it shows a tractor. Therefore, when machines had been improved until they were really practicable and profitable, the builders of those large tools, the machine manufacturers, began to look for customers who could afford to pay for them in cash. During the early Middle Ages, when land had been almost the only form of wealth, the nobility were the only people who were considered wealthy. But, as I have told you in a previous chapter, the gold and silver which they possessed was quite insignificant, and they used the old system of barter, exchanging cows for horses and eggs for honey. During the Crusades, the burghers of the cities had been able to gather riches from the reviving trade between the East and the West, and they had been serious rivals of the lords and the knights. The French Revolution had entirely destroyed the wealth of the nobility, and had enormously increased that of the middle class or bourgeoisie. The years of unrest which followed the Great Revolution had offered many middle class people a chance to get more than their share of this world's goods. The estates of the church had been confiscated by the French Convention, and had been sold at auction. There had been a terrific amount of graft. Land speculators had stolen thousands of square miles of valuable land, and during the Napoleonic Wars they had used their capital to profiteer in grain and gunpowder, and now they possessed more wealth than they needed for the actual expenses of their households, and they could afford to build themselves factories, and to hire men and women to work the machines. This caused a very abrupt change in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Within a few years, many cities doubled the number of their inhabitants, and the old civic center which had been the real home of the citizens was surrounded with ugly and cheaply built suburbs where the workmen slept after their eleven or twelve or thirteen hours spent in the factories, and from where they returned to the factory as soon as the whistle blew. Far and wide throughout the countryside, there was talk of the fabulous sums of money that could be made in the towns. The peasant boy, accustomed to a life in the open, went to the city. He rapidly lost his old health amidst the smoke and dust and dirt of those early and badly ventilated workshops, and the end, very often, was death in the poorhouse or in the hospital. Of course, the change from the farm to the factory on the part of so many people was not accomplished without a certain amount of opposition. Since one engine could do as much work as a hundred men, the ninety-nine others who were thrown out of employment did not like it. Frequently they attacked the factory buildings and set fire to the machines, but insurance companies had been organized as early as the seventeenth century, and as a rule the owners were well protected against loss. Here you see a picture of a very large building with lots of smoke coming out of smokestacks on the top, and it's titled The Factory. Soon, newer and better machines were installed. The factory was surrounded with a high wall, and then there was an end to the rioting. The ancient guilds could not possibly survive in this new world of steam and iron. They went out of existence, 
and then the workmen tried to organize regular labor unions. But the factory owners, who through their wealth could exercise great influence upon the politicians of the different countries, went to the legislature, and had laws passed which forbade the forming of such trade unions, because they interfered with the liberty of action of the working man. Please do not think that the good members of Parliament who passed these laws were wicked tyrants. They were the true sons of the revolutionary period, when everybody talked of liberty, and when people often killed their neighbors because they were not quite as liberty-loving as they ought to have been. Since liberty was the foremost virtue of man, it was not right that labor unions should dictate to their members the hours during which they could work, and the wages which they must demand. The workman must at all times be free to sell his services in the open market, and the employer must be equally free to conduct his business as he saw fit. The days of the mercantile system, when the state had regulated the industrial life of the entire community, were coming to an end. The new idea of freedom insisted that the state stand entirely aside and let commerce take its course. The last half of the 18th century had not merely been a time of intellectual and political doubt, but the old economic ideas, too, had been replaced by new ones, which better suited the need of the hour. Several years before the French Revolution, Turgot, who had been one of the unsuccessful ministers of finance of Louis the Sixteenth, had preached the novel doctrine of economic liberty. Turgot lived in a country which had suffered from too much red tape, too many regulations, too many officials trying to enforce too many laws. Remove this official supervision, he wrote, let the people do as they please, and everything will be all right. Soon his famous advice of laissez-faire became the battle cry around which the economists of that period rallied. At the same time in England, Adam Smith was working on his mighty volumes on the wealth of nations, which made another plea for liberty and the natural rights of trade. Thirty years later, after the fall of Napoleon, when the reactionary powers of Europe had gained their victory at Vienna, that same freedom which was denied to the people in their political relations was forced upon them in their industrial life. The general use of machinery, as I have said at the beginning of this chapter, proved to be of great advantage to the state. Wealth increased rapidly. The machine made it possible for a single country, like England, to carry all the burdens of the great Napoleonic Wars. The capitalists, the people who provided the money with which machines were bought, reaped enormous profits. They became ambitious and began to take an interest in politics. They tried to compete with the landed aristocracy, which still exercised great influence upon the government of most European countries. In England, where the members of Parliament were still elected according to a royal decree of the year 1265, and where a large number of recently created industrial centers were without representation, they brought about the passing of the Reform Bill of the year 1832, which changed the electoral system and gave the class of the factory owners more influence upon the legislative body. This, however, caused great discontent among the millions of factory workers, who were left without any voice in the government. They, too, began an agitation for the right to vote. They put their demands down in a document, which came to be known as the People's Charter. The debates about this charter grew more and more violent, they had not yet come to an end when the revolutions of the year 1848 broke out. Frightened by the threat of a new outbreak of Jacobinism and violence, the English government placed the Duke of Wellington, who was now in his 80th year, at the head of the army and called for volunteers. London was a place in a state of siege, and preparations were made to suppress the coming revolution. But the Chartist movement killed itself through bad leadership, and no acts of violence took place. The new class of wealthy factory owners, I dislike the word bourgeoisie, which had been used to death by the apostles of a new social order, slowly increased its hold upon the government, and the conditions of industrial life in the large cities continued to transform vast acres of pasture and wheatland into dreary slums, which guard the approach of every modern European town. End of chapter 58. Recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California. June 2009. Chapter 59 of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. 
Chapter 59. Emancipation. The general introduction of machinery did not bring about the era of happiness and prosperity which had been predicted by the generation which saw the stagecoach replaced by the railroad. Several remedies were suggested, but none of these quite solved the problem. In the year 1831, just before the passing of the first reform bill, Jeremy Bentham, the great English student of legislative methods, and the most practical political reformer of that day, wrote to a friend, "'The way to be comfortable is to make others comfortable. The way to make others comfortable is to appear to love them. The way to appear to love them is to love them in reality.'" Jeremy was an honest man. He said what he believed to be true. His opinions were shared by thousands of his countrymen. They felt responsible for the happiness of their less fortunate neighbours, and they tried their very best to help them. And heaven knows it was time that something be done. The ideal of economic freedom, the laissez-faire of Turgot, had been necessary in the old society where medieval restrictions lamed all industrial effort. But this liberty of action, which had been the highest law of the land, had led to a terrible, yea, a frightful condition. The hours in the factory were limited only by the physical strength of the workers. As long as a woman could sit before her loom, without fainting from fatigue, she was supposed to work. Children of five and six were taken to the cotton mills, to save them from the dangers of the street and a life of idleness. A law had been passed which forced the children of paupers to go to work, or be punished by being chained to their machines. In return for their services they got enough bad food to keep them alive, and a sort of pigsty in which they could rest at night. Often they were so tired that they fell asleep at their job. To keep them awake, a foreman with a whip made the rounds and beat them on the knuckles when it was necessary to bring them back to their duties. Of course, under these circumstances, thousands of little children died. This was regrettable, and the employers, who after all were human beings, and not without a heart, sincerely wished that they could abolish child labour. But since man was free, it followed that children were free too. Besides, if Mr. Jones had tried to work his factory without the use of children of five and six, his rival, Mr. Stone, would have hired an extra supply of little boys, and Jones would have been forced into bankruptcy. It was therefore impossible for Jones to do without child labour until such time as an act of Parliament should forbid it for all employers. But as Parliament was no longer dominated by the old landed aristocracy, which had despised the upstart factory owners with their money-bags, and had treated them with open contempt, but was under control of the representatives from the industrial centres, and as long as the law did not allow workmen to combine in labour unions, very little was accomplished. Of course the intelligent and decent people of that time were not blind to these terrible conditions, they were just helpless. Machinery had conquered the world by surprise, and it took a great many years, and the efforts of thousands of noble men and women, to make the machine what it ought to be, man's servant, and not his master. Curiously enough, the first attack upon the outrageous system of employment which was then common in all parts of the world, was made on behalf of the black slaves of Africa and America. Slavery had been introduced into the American continent by the Spaniards. They had tried to use the Indians as labourers in the fields and in the mines, but the Indians, when taken away from a life in the open, had lain down and died, and to save them from extinction a kind-hearted priest had suggested that negroes be brought from Africa to do the work. The negroes were strong and could stand rough treatment. Besides, association with the white man would give them a chance to learn Christianity, and in this way they would be able to save their souls— and so from every possible point of view it would be an excellent arrangement, both for the kindly white man and for his ignorant black brother. But with the introduction of machinery there had been a greater demand for cotton, and the negroes were forced to work harder than ever before, and they too, like the Indians, began to die under the treatment which they received at the hands of the overseers. Stories of incredible cruelty constantly found their way to Europe, and in all countries men and women began to agitate for the abolition of slavery. 
In England, William Wilberforce and Zachary Macaulay, the father of the great historian whose history of England you must read if you want to know how wonderfully interesting a history book can be, organized a society for the suppression of slavery. First of all, they got a law passed which made slave trading illegal, and after the year 1840 there was not a single slave in any of the British colonies. The Revolution of 1848 put an end to slavery in the French possessions. The Portuguese passed a law in the year 1858 which promised all slaves their liberty in twenty years from that date. The Dutch abolished slavery in 1863, and in the same year Tsar Alexander II returned to his serfs that liberty which had been taken away from them more than two centuries before. In the United States of America the question led to grave difficulties and a prolonged war. Although the Declaration of Independence had laid down the principle that all men were created free and equal, an exception had been made for those men and women whose skins were dark and who worked on the plantations of the southern states. As time went on, the dislike of the people of the North for the institution of slavery increased, and they made no secret of their feelings. The Southerners, however, claimed that they could not grow their cotton without slave labor, and for almost fifty years a mighty debate raged in both the Congress and the Senate. The North remained obdurate, and the South would not give in. When it appeared impossible to reach a compromise, the Southern states threatened to leave the Union. It was a most dangerous point in the history of the Union. Many things might have happened. That they did not happen was the work of a very great and very good man. On the 6th of November of the year 1860, Abraham Lincoln, an Illinois lawyer and a man who had made his own intellectual fortune, had been elected president by the Republicans, who were very strong in the anti-slavery states. He knew the evils of human bondage at first hand, and his shrewd common sense told him that there was no room on the northern continent for two rival nations. When a number of southern states seceded and formed the Confederate States of America, Lincoln accepted the challenge. The northern states were called upon for volunteers. Hundreds of thousands of young men responded with eager enthusiasm, and there followed four years of bitter civil war. The South, better prepared and following the brilliant leadership of Lee and Jackson, repeatedly defeated the armies of the North. Then the economic strength of New England and the West began to tell. An unknown officer by the name of Grant arose from obscurity and became the Charles Martel of the Great Slave War. Without interruption he hammered his mighty blows upon the crumbling defenses of the South. Early in the year 1863, President Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, which set all slaves free. In April of the year 1865, Lee surrendered the last of his brave armies at Appomattox. A few days later, President Lincoln was murdered by a lunatic, but his work was done. With the exception of Cuba, which was still under Spanish domination, slavery had come to an end in every part of the civilized world. But while the black man was enjoying an increasing amount of liberty, the free workmen of Europe did not fare quite so well. Indeed, it is a matter of surprise to many contemporary writers and observers that the masses of workmen, the so-called proletariat, did not die out from sheer misery. They lived in dirty houses situated in miserable parts of the slums. They ate bad food. They received just enough schooling to fit them for their tasks. In case of death or an accident, their families were not provided for. But the brewery and distillery interests, who could exercise great influence upon the legislature, encouraged them to forget their woes by offering them unlimited quantities of whiskey and gin at very cheap rates. The enormous improvement which has taken place since the thirties and the forties of the last century is not due to the efforts of a single man. The best brains of two generations devoted themselves to the task of saving the world from the disastrous results of the all-too-sudden introduction of machinery. They did not try to destroy the capitalistic system. This would have been very foolish, for the accumulated wealth of other people, when intelligently used, may be of very great benefit to all mankind. 
but they tried to combat the notion that true equality can exist between the man who has wealth and owns the factories and can close their doors at will without the risk of going hungry and the laborer who must take whatever job is offered at whatever wage he can get or face the risk of starvation for himself his wife and his children they endeavored to introduce a number of laws which regulated the relations between the factory owners and the factory workers in this the reformers have been increasingly successful in all countries Today the majority of the laborers are well protected, their hours are being reduced to the excellent average of eight, and their children are sent to the schools instead of to the mine pit and to the carding room of the cotton mills. But there were other men who also contemplated the sight of all the belching smokestacks, who heard the rattle of the railroad trains, who saw the storehouses filled with a surplus of all sorts of materials and who wondered to what ultimate goal this tremendous activity would lead in the years to come. They remembered that the human race had lived for hundreds of thousands of years without commercial and industrial competition. Could they change the existing order of things and do away with a system of rivalry which so often sacrificed human happiness to profits? This idea, this vague hope for a better day, was not restricted to a single country. In England, Robert Owen, the owner of many cotton mills, established a so-called socialistic community, which was a success. But when he died, the prosperity of New Lanark came to an end, and an attempt of Louis Blanc, a French journalist, to establish social workshops all over France fared no better. Indeed, the increasing number of socialistic writers soon began to see that little individual communities which remained outside of the regular industrial life would never be able to accomplish anything at all. It was necessary to study the fundamental principles underlying the whole industrial and capitalistic society before useful remedies could be suggested. The practical socialists, like Robert Owen and Louis Blanc and François Fournier, were succeeded by theoretical students of socialism like Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Of these two, Marx is the best known. He was a very brilliant Jew, whose family had for a long time lived in Germany. He had heard of the experiments of Owen and Blanc, and he began to interest himself in questions of labor and wages and employment. But his liberal views made him very unpopular with the police authorities of Germany, and he was forced to flee to Brussels, and then to London, where he lived a poor and shabby life, as the correspondent of the New York Tribune. No one thus far had paid much attention to his books on economic subjects, but in the year 1864 he organized the first International Association of Working Men, and three years later, in 1867, he published the first volume of his well-known treatise called Capital. Marx believed that all history was a long struggle between those who have and those who don't have. The introduction and general use of machinery had created a new class in society, that of the capitalists, who used their surplus wealth to buy the tools, which were then used by the laborers to produce still more wealth, which was again used to build more factories, and so on, until the end of time. Meanwhile, according to Marx, the third estate, the bourgeois, was growing richer and richer, and the fourth estate, the proletariat, was growing poorer and poorer, and he predicted that in the end one man would possess all the wealth of the world, while the others would be his employees, and dependent upon his good will. To prevent such a state of affairs, Marx advised working men of all countries to unite and to fight for a number of political and economic measures, which he had enumerated in a manifesto in the year 1848, the year of the last great European revolution. These views, of course, were very unpopular with the governments of Europe, Many countries, especially Prussia, passed severe laws against the socialists, and policemen were ordered to break up the socialist meetings and to arrest the speakers. But that sort of persecution never does any good. Martyrs are the best possible advertisements for an unpopular cause. In Europe the number of socialists steadily increased, and it was soon clear that the socialists did not contemplate a violent revolution, but were using their increasing power in the different parliaments, to promote the interests of the laboring classes. 
Socialists were even called upon to act as cabinet ministers, and they cooperated with progressive Catholics and Protestants to undo the damage that had been caused by the Industrial Revolution, and to bring about a fairer division of the many benefits which had followed the introduction of machinery and the increased production of wealth. End of chapter 59 Read on June 2, 2009, in San Diego, California Chapter 60 of the Story of Mankind This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loon Chapter 60 The Age of Science But the world had undergone another change, which was of greater importance than either the political or the industrial revolutions. After generations of oppression and persecution, the scientist had at last gained liberty of action, and he was now trying to discover the fundamental laws which govern the universe. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Greeks, and the Romans had all contributed something to the first vague notions of science and scientific investigation. But the great migrations of the fourth century had destroyed the classical world of the Mediterranean, and the Christian church, which was more interested in the life of the soul than in the life of the body, had regarded science as a manifestation of that human arrogance which wanted to pry into divine affairs which belonged to the realm of Almighty God, and which therefore was closely related to the seven deadly sins. Here you see a picture entitled The Philosopher of a man walking near windmills through a field. The Renaissance, to a certain but limited extent, had broken through this wall of medieval prejudices, the Reformation, however, which had overtaken the Renaissance in the early 16th century, had been hostile to the ideals of the new civilization, and once more the men of science were threatened with severe punishment should they try to pass beyond the narrow limits of knowledge which had been laid down in holy writ. Our world is filled with the statues of great generals, atop of prancing horses, leading their cheering soldiers to glorious victory. Here and there a modest slab of marble announces that a man of science has found his final resting place. A thousand years from now we shall probably do these things differently, and the children of that happy generation shall know of the splendid courage and the almost inconceivable devotion to duty of the men who were the pioneers of that abstract knowledge which alone has made our modern world a practical possibility. Many of these scientific pioneers suffered poverty and contempt and humiliation. They lived in garrets and died in dungeons. They dared not print their names on the title pages of their books, and they dared not print their conclusions in the land of their birth, but smuggled the manuscripts to some secret printing shop in Amsterdam or Harlem. They were exposed to the bitter enmity of the church, both Protestant and Catholic, and were the subjects of endless sermons, inciting the parishioners to violence against the heretics. Here and there they found an asylum, in Holland, where the spirit of tolerance was strongest, the authorities, while regarding these scientific investigations with little favor, yet refused to interfere with people's freedom of thought. It became a little asylum for intellectual liberty, where French and English and German philosophers and mathematicians and physicians could go to enjoy a short spell of rest and get a breath of free air. In another chapter, I have told you how Roger Bacon, the great genius of the 13th century, was prevented for years from writing a single word, lest he get into new troubles with the authorities of the church. And five hundred years later, the contributors to the great philosophic encyclopedia were under the constant supervision of the French gendarmerie. Half a century afterwards, Darwin, who dared to question the story of the creation of man as revealed in the Bible, was denounced from every pulpit as an enemy of the human race. Even today, the persecution of those who venture into the unknown realm of science has not entirely come to an end. And while I am writing this, Mr. Bryan is addressing a vast multitude on the menace of Darwinism, warning his hearers against the errors of the great English naturalist. All this, however, is a mere detail. The work that has to be done invariably gets done, and the ultimate profit of the discoveries and the inventions goes to the mass of those same people who have always decried the man of vision as an unpractical idealist. The seventeenth century had still preferred to investigate the far-off heavens 
and to study the position of our planet in relation to the solar system. Even so, the church had disapproved of this unseemly curiosity, and Copernicus, who first of all had proved that the sun was the center of the universe, did not publish his work until the day of his death. Galileo spent the greater part of his life under the supervision of the clerical authorities, but he continued to use his telescope and provided Isaac Newton with a mass of practical observations, which greatly helped the English mathematician when he discovered the existence of that interesting habit of falling objects, which came to be known as the law of gravitation. Here you see a picture of a man standing in the corner of a very large hallway, and it's entitled Galileo. That, for the moment at least, exhausted the interest in the heavens, and man began to study the earth. The invention of a workable microscope, a strange and clumsy little thing, by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, during the last half of the 17th century, gave man a chance to study the microscopic creatures who are responsible for so many of his ailments. It laid the foundations of the science of bacteriology, which in the last 40 years has delivered the world from a great number of diseases by discovering the tiny organisms which cause the complaint. It also allowed the geologists to make a more careful study of different rocks and of the fossils, the petrified prehistoric plants, which they found deep below the surface of the earth. These investigations convinced them that the earth must be a great deal older than was stated in the book of Genesis, and in the year 1830, Sir Charles Lyell published his Principles of Geology, which denied the story of creation as related in the Bible, and gave a far more wonderful description of slow growth and gradual development. Here you see a picture of a blimp high up in the sky, and it's entitled the Dirigible, which is another name for a blimp. At the same time, the Marquise de Laplace was working on a new theory of creation, which made the earth a little blotch in the nebulous sea out of which the planetary system had been formed, and Bunsen and Kirchhoff, by the use of the spectroscope, were investigating the chemical composition of the stars and of our good neighbor the sun, whose curious spots had first been noticed by Galileo. Meanwhile, after a most bitter and relentless warfare with the clerical authorities of Catholic and Protestant lands, the anatomists and physiologists had at last obtained permission to dissect bodies, and to substitute a positive knowledge of our organs and their habits for the guesswork of the medieval quack. Within a single generation, between 1810 and 1840, more progress was made in every branch of science than in all the hundreds of thousands of years that had passed since man first looked at the stars and wondered why they were there. It must have been a very sad age for the people who had been educated under the old system, and we can understand their feeling of hatred for such men as Lamarck and Darwin, who did not exactly tell them that they were descended from monkeys, an accusation which our grandfathers seemed to regard as a personal insult, but who suggested that the proud human race had evolved from a long series of ancestors who could trace the family tree back to the little jellyfishes who were the first inhabitants of our planet. The dignified world of the well-to-do middle class, which dominated the 19th century, was willing to make use of the gas or the electric light, of all the many practical applications of the great scientific discoveries, but the mere investigator, the man of the scientific theory without whom no progress would be possible, continued to be distrusted until very recently. Then at last his services were recognized. Today the rich people who in past ages donated their wealth for the building of a cathedral construct vast laboratories where silent men do battle upon the hidden enemies of mankind, and often sacrifice their lives that coming generations may enjoy greater happiness and health. Indeed, it has come to pass that many of the ills of this world, which our ancestors regarded as inevitable acts of God, have been exposed as manifestations of our own ignorance and neglect. Every child nowadays knows that he can keep from getting typhoid fever by a little care in the choice of his drinking water but it took years and years of hard work before the doctors could convince people of this fact. Few of us now fear the dentist chair. A study of the microbes that live in our mouth has made it possible to keep our teeth from decay. Must perchance a tooth be pulled, then we take a sniff of gas and go our way rejoicing. When the newspapers of the year 1846 brought the story of the painless operation, which had been performed in America with the help of ether, the good people of Europe shook their heads. 
To them it seemed against the will of God that man should escape the pain which was the share of all mortals, and it took a long time before the practice of taking ether and chloroform for operations became general. But the battle of progress had been won. The breach in the old walls of prejudice was growing larger and larger, and as time went by, the ancient stones of ignorance came crumbling down. The eager crusaders of a new and happier social order rushed forward. Suddenly they found themselves facing a new obstacle. Out of the ruins of a long-gone past, another citadel of reaction had been erected, and millions of men had to give their lives before this last bulwark was destroyed. End of chapter 60, recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, June 2009. Chapter 61 of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. Chapter 61 Art. A Chapter of Art. When a baby is perfectly healthy and has had enough to eat, and has slept all it wants, then it hums a little tune to show how happy it is. To grown-ups this humming means nothing. It sounds like goo-zum, goo-zum, goo, but to the baby it is perfect music. It is his first contribution to art. As soon as he or she gets a little older and is able to sit up, the period of mud-pie making begins. These mud-pies do not interest the outside world, there are too many million babies making too many million mud pies at the same time, but to the small infant they represent another expedition into the pleasant realm of art. The baby is now a sculptor. At the age of three or four, when the hands begin to obey the brain, the child becomes a painter. His fond mother gives him a box of coloured chalks, and every loose bit of paper is rapidly covered with strange pot-hooks and scrawls, which represent houses and horses, and terrible naval battles. Soon, however, this happiness of just making things comes to an end. School begins, and the greater part of the day is filled up with work. The business of living, or rather the business of making a living, becomes the most important event in the life of every boy and girl. There is little time left for art, between learning the tables of multiplication and the past participles of the irregular French verbs. And unless the desire for making certain things for the mere pleasure of creating them, without any hope of a practical return, be very strong, the child grows into manhood and forgets that the first five years of his life were mainly devoted to art. Nations are not different from children. As soon as the caveman had escaped the threatening dangers of the long and shivering ice period, and had put his house in order, he began to make certain things which he thought beautiful, although they were of no earthly use to him in his fight with the wild animals of the jungle. He covered the walls of his grotto with pictures of the elephants and the deer which he hunted, and out of a piece of stone he hacked the rough figures of those women he thought most attractive. As soon as the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Persians and all the other people of the East had founded their little countries along the Nile and the Euphrates, they began to build magnificent palaces for their kings, invented bright pieces of jewellery for their women, and planted gardens which sang happy songs of colour with their many bright flowers. Our own ancestors, the wandering nomads from the distant Asiatic prairies, enjoying a free and easy existence as fighters and hunters, composed songs which celebrated the mighty deeds of their great leaders, and invented a form of poetry which has survived until our own day. A thousand years later, when they had established themselves on the Greek mainland, and had built their city-states, they expressed their joy and their sorrows in magnificent temples, in statues, in comedies and in tragedies, and in every conceivable form of art. The Romans, like their Carthaginian rivals, were too busy administering other people and making money to have much love for useless and unprofitable adventures of the spirit. They conquered the world and built roads and bridges, but they borrowed their art wholesale from the Greeks. 
they invented certain practical forms of architecture which answered the demands of their day and age but their statues and their histories and their mosaics and their poems were mere latin imitations of greek originals without that vague and hard to define something which the world calls personality there can be no art and the roman world distrusted that particular sort of personality the empire needed efficient soldiers and tradesmen the business of writing poetry or making pictures was left to foreigners then came the dark ages the barbarian was the proverbial bull in the china shop of western europe he had no use for what he did not understand speaking in terms of the year nineteen twenty one he liked the magazine covers of pretty ladies but threw the rembrandt etchings which he had inherited into the ash can soon he came to learn better then he tried to undo the damage which he had created a few years before but the ash cans were gone and so were the pictures but by this time his own art which he had brought with him from the east had developed into something very beautiful and he made up for his past neglect and indifference by the so-called art of the middle ages which as far as northern europe is concerned was a product of the germanic mind and had borrowed but little from the greeks and the latins and nothing at all from the older forms of art of egypt and assyria not to speak of india and china which simply did not exist as far as the people of that time were concerned indeed so little had the northern races been influenced by their southern neighbours that their own architectural products were completely misunderstood by the people of italy and were treated by them with downright and unmitigated contempt you have all heard the word gothic you probably associate it with the picture of a lovely old cathedral lifting its slender spires towards high heaven but what does the word really mean it means something uncouth and barbaric something which one might expect from an uncivilized goth a rough backwoods man who had no respect for the established rules of classical art and who built his modern horrors to please his own low tastes without a decent regard for the examples of the forum and the acropolis and yet for several centuries this form of gothic architecture was the highest expression of the sincere feeling for art which inspired the whole northern continent from a previous chapter you will remember how the people of the late middle ages lived unless they were peasants and dwelt in villages they were citizens of a city or civitas the old latin name for a tribe and indeed behind their high walls and their deep moats these good burghers were true tribesmen who shared the common dangers and enjoyed the common safety and prosperity which they derived from their system of mutual protection in the old greek and roman cities the market-place where the temple stood had been the centre of civic life during the middle ages the church the house of god became such a centre we modern protestant people who go to our church only once a week and then for a few hours only hardly know what a medieval church meant to the community then before you were a week old you were taken to the church to be baptized as a child you visited the church to learn the holy stories of the scriptures later on you became a member of the congregation and if you were rich enough you built yourself a separate little chapel sacred to the memory of the patron saint of your own family as for the sacred edifice it was open at all hours of the day and many of the night in a certain sense it resembled a modern club dedicated to all the inhabitants of the town in the church you very likely caught a first glimpse of the girl who was to become your bride at a great ceremony before the high altar and finally when the end of the journey had come you were buried beneath the stones of this familiar building that all your children and their grandchildren might pass over your grave until the day of judgment because the church was not only the house of god but also the true centre of all common life the building had to be different from anything that had ever been constructed by the hands of man the temples of the egyptians and the greeks and the romans had been merely the shrine of a local divinity as no sermons were preached before the images of osiris or zeus or jupiter 
it was not necessary that the interior offer space for a great multitude. All the religious processions of the old Mediterranean peoples took place in the open. But in the north, where the weather was usually bad, most functions were held under the roof of the church. During many centuries the architects struggled with this problem of constructing a building that was large enough. The Roman tradition taught them how to build heavy stone walls with very small windows, lest the walls lose their strength. On the top of this they then placed a heavy stone roof. But in the twelfth century, after the beginning of the Crusades, when the architects had seen the pointed arches of the Mohammedan builders, the western builders discovered a new style, which gave them their first chance to make the sort of building which those days of an intense religious life demanded. And then they developed this strange style, upon which the Italians bestowed the contemptuous name of Gothic, or barbaric. They achieved their purpose by inventing a vaulted roof, which was supported by ribs. But such a roof, if it became too heavy, was apt to break the walls, just as a man of three hundred pounds sitting down upon a child's chair will force it to collapse. To overcome this difficulty, certain French architects then began to reinforce the walls with buttresses, which were merely heavy masses of stone against which the walls could lean, while they supported the roof. And to assure the further safety of the roof, they supported the ribs of the roof by so-called flying buttresses, a very simple method of construction which you will understand at once when you look at our picture. This new method of construction allowed the introduction of enormous windows. In the twelfth century glass was still an expensive curiosity, and very few private buildings possessed glass windows. Even the castles of the nobles were without protection, and this accounts for the eternal draughts, and explains why people of that day wore furs indoors as well as out. Fortunately, the art of making coloured glass, with which the ancient people of the Mediterranean had been familiar, had not been entirely lost. There was a revival of stained glass-making, and soon the windows of the Gothic churches told the stories of the holy book in little bits of brilliantly coloured window-pane, which were caught in a long framework of lead. Behold, therefore, the new and glorious house of God, filled with an eager multitude, living its religion as no people have ever done either before or since. Nothing is considered too good or too costly or too wondrous for this house of God and home of man. The sculptors, who since the destruction of the Roman Empire have been out of employment, haltingly return to their noble art. Portals and pillars and buttresses and cornices are all covered with carven images of our Lord and the blessed saints. The embroiderers, too, are set to work to make tapestries for the walls. The jewellers offer their highest art, that the shrine of the altar may be worthy of complete adoration. Even the painter does his best. Poor man! He is greatly handicapped by lack of a suitable medium. And thereby hangs a story. The Romans of the early Christian period had covered the floors and the walls of their temples and houses with mosaics, pictures made of coloured bits of glass. But this art had been exceedingly difficult. It gave the painter no chance to express all he wanted to say, as all children know who have ever tried to make figures out of coloured blocks of wood. The art of mosaic painting therefore died out during the late Middle Ages except in Russia, where the Byzantine mosaic painters had found a refuge after the fall of Constantinople, and continued to ornament the walls of the Orthodox churches until the day of the Bolsheviki, when there was an end to the building of churches. Of course the medieval painter could mix his colours with the water of the wet plaster which was put upon the walls of the churches. This method of painting upon fresh plaster, which was generally called fresco, or fresh painting, was very popular for many centuries. Today it is as rare as the art of painting miniatures in manuscripts, and among the hundreds of artists of our modern cities there is perhaps one who can handle this medium successfully. But during the Middle Ages there was no other way, and the artists were fresco workers, for lack of something better. 
The method, however, had certain great disadvantages. Very often the plaster came off the walls after only a few years, or dampness spoiled the pictures, just as dampness will spoil the pattern of our wallpaper. People tried every imaginable expedient to get away from this plaster background. They tried to mix their colours with wine and vinegar and with honey and with the sticky white of egg, but none of these methods were satisfactory. For more than a thousand years these experiments continued. In painting pictures upon the parchment leaves of manuscripts, the medieval artists were very successful, but when it came to covering large spaces of wood or stone with paint which would stick, they did not succeed very well. At last, during the first half of the fifteenth century, the problem was solved in the southern Netherlands by Jan and Hubert van Eyck. The famous Flemish brothers mixed their paint with specially prepared oils, and this allowed them to use wood and canvas or stone or anything else as a background for their pictures. But by this time the religious ardour of the early Middle Ages was a thing of the past. The rich burghers of the cities were succeeding the bishops as patrons of the arts. And as art invariably follows the full dinner pail, the artists now began to work for these worldly employers, and painted pictures for kings, for grand dukes, and for rich bankers. Within a very short time the new method of painting with oil spread through Europe, and in every country there developed a school of special painting which showed the characteristic tastes of the people for whom these portraits and landscapes were made. In Spain, for example, Velázquez painted court dwarfs and the weavers of the royal tapestry factories, and all sorts of persons and subjects connected with the king and his court. But in Holland, Rembrandt and Franz Hals and Vermeer painted the barnyard of the merchant's house, and they painted his rather dowdy wife, and his healthy but bumptious children, and the ships which had brought him his wealth. In Italy, on the other hand, where the Pope remained the largest patron of the arts, Michelangelo and Correggio continued to paint Madonnas and saints, while in England, where the aristocracy was very rich and powerful, and in France, where the kings had become uppermost in the state, the artists painted distinguished gentlemen who were members of the government, and very lovely ladies who were friends of his majesty. The great change in painting which came about with the neglect of the old church and the rise of a new class in society was reflected in all other forms of art. The invention of printing had made it possible for authors to win fame and reputation by writing books for the multitudes. In this way arose the profession of the novelist and the illustrator. But the people who had money enough to buy the new books were not the sort who liked to sit at home of nights, looking at the ceiling, or just sitting. They wanted to be amused. The few minstrels of the Middle Ages were not sufficient to cover the demand for entertainment. For the first time since the early Greek city-states of two thousand years before, the professional playwright had a chance to ply his trade. The Middle Ages had known the theatre merely as part of certain church celebrations. The tragedies of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries had told the story of the suffering of our Lord. But during the sixteenth century the worldly theatre made its reappearance. It is true that, at first, the position of the professional playwright and actor was not a very high one. William Shakespeare was regarded as a sort of circus fellow who amused his neighbours with his tragedies and comedies. But when he died in the year 1616, he had begun to enjoy the respect of his neighbours, and actors were no longer subjects of police supervision. William's contemporary, Lope de Vega, the incredible Spaniard who wrote no less than 1,800 worldly and 400 religious plays, was a person of rank who received the papal approval upon his work. A century later, Moliere, the Frenchman, was deemed worthy of the companionship of none less than King Louis the Fourteenth. Since then the theatre has enjoyed an ever-increasing affection on the part of the people. Today a theatre is part of every well-regulated city, and the silent drama of the movies has penetrated to the tiniest of our prairie hamlets. 
Another art, however, was to become the most popular of all. That was music. Most of the old art forms demanded a great deal of technical skill. It takes years and years of practice before our clumsy hand is able to follow the commands of the brain and reproduce our vision upon canvas or in marble. It takes a lifetime to learn how to act or how to write a good novel. And it takes a great deal of training on the part of the public to appreciate the best in painting and writing and sculpture. But almost anyone, not entirely tone-deaf, can follow a tune, and almost everybody can get enjoyment out of some sort of music. The Middle Ages had heard a little music, but it had been entirely the music of the church. The holy chants were subject to very severe laws of rhythm and harmony, and soon these became monotonous. Besides, they could not well be sung in the street or in the marketplace. The Renaissance changed this. Music once more came into its own as the best friend of man, both in his happiness and in his sorrows. The Egyptians and the Babylonians and the ancient Jews had all been great lovers of music. They had even combined different instruments into regular orchestras, but the Greeks had frowned upon this barbaric foreign noise. They liked to hear a man recite the stately poetry of Homer and Pindar. They allowed him to accompany himself upon the lyre, the poorest of all stringed instruments. That was as far as anyone could go without incurring the risk of popular disapproval. The Romans, on the other hand, had loved orchestral music at their dinners and parties, and they had invented most of the instruments which, in very modified form, we use today. The early church had despised this music which smacked too much of the wicked pagan world which had just been destroyed. A few songs rendered by the entire congregation were all the bishops of the third and fourth centuries would tolerate. As the congregation was apt to sing dreadfully out of key without the guidance of an instrument, the church had afterwards allowed the use of an organ, an invention of the second century of our era, which consisted of a combination of the old pipes of Pan and a pair of bellows. Then came the great migrations. The last of the Roman musicians were either killed or became tramp fiddlers going from city to city and playing in the street and begging for pennies like the harpist on a modern ferry boat. But the revival of a more worldly civilization in the cities of the late Middle Ages had created a new demand for musicians. Instruments like the horn, which had been used only as a signal instrument for hunting and fighting, were remodeled until they could reproduce sounds which were agreeable in the dance hall and in the banqueting room. A bow strung with horse hair was used to play the old-fashioned guitar, and before the end of the Middle Ages the six-stringed instrument, the most ancient of all string instruments which dates back to Egypt and Assyria, had grown into our modern four-stringed fiddle, which Stradivarius and other Italian violin makers of the eighteenth century brought to the height of perfection. And finally the modern piano was invented, the most widespread of all musical instruments, which has followed man into the wilderness of the jungle and the ice fields of Greenland. The organ had been the first of all keyed instruments, but the performer always depended upon the cooperation of someone who worked the bellows, a job which nowadays is done by electricity. The musicians therefore looked for a handier and less circumstantial instrument to assist them in training the pupils of the many church choirs. During the great eleventh century, Guido, a Benedictine monk of the town of Arezzo, the birthplace of the poet Petrarch, gave us our modern system of musical annotation. Sometime during that century, when there was a great deal of popular interest in music, the first instrument with both keys and strings was built. It must have sounded as tinkly as one of those tiny children's pianos which you can buy at every toy shop. In the city of Vienna, the town where the strolling musicians of the Middle Ages, who had been classed with jugglers and card sharps, had formed the first separate guild of musicians in the year 1288, the little monochord was developed into something which we can recognize as the direct ancestor of our modern Steinway. From Austria, the clavichord, as it was usually called in those days, because it had claves, or keys, went to Italy. 
there it was perfected into the spinet, which was so called after the inventor, Giovanni Spinetti, of Venice. At last, during the eighteenth century, some time between 1709 and 1720, Bartolomeo Cristofori made a clavier, which allowed the performer to play both loudly and softly, or, as it was said in Italian, piano and forte. This instrument, with certain changes, became our pianoforte, or piano. Then, for the first time, the world possessed an easy and convenient instrument, which could be mastered in a couple of years, and did not need the eternal tuning of harps and fiddles, and was much pleasanter to the ears than the medieval tubas, clarinets, trombones, and oboes. Just as the phonograph has given millions of modern people their first love of music, so did the early pianoforte carry the knowledge of music into much wider circles. Music became part of the education of every well-bred man and woman. Princes and rich merchants maintained private orchestras. The musician ceased to be a wandering jongleur, and became a highly valued member of the community. Music was added to the dramatic performances of the theatre, and out of this practice grew our modern opera. Originally only a few very rich princes could afford the expenses of an opera troupe, but as the taste for this sort of entertainment grew, many cities built their own theatres, where Italian and afterwards German operas were given to the unlimited joy of the whole community, with the exception of a few sects of very strict Christians, who still regarded music with deep suspicion, as something which was too lovely to be entirely good for the soul. By the middle of the eighteenth century the musical life of Europe was in full swing. Then there came forward a man who was greater than all others, a simple organist of the Thomas Church of Leipzig, by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. In his compositions for every known instrument, from comic songs and popular dances to the most stately of sacred hymns and oratorios, he laid the foundation for all our modern music. When he died in the year 1750, he was succeeded by Mozart, who created musical fabrics of sheer loveliness, which remind us of lace that has been woven out of harmony and rhythm. Then came Ludwig van Beethoven, the most tragic of men, who gave us our modern orchestra, yet heard none of his greatest compositions because he was deaf, as the result of a cold contracted during his years of poverty. Beethoven lived through the period of the great French Revolution. Full of hope for a new and glorious day, he had dedicated one of his symphonies to Napoleon, but he lived to regret the hour. When he died in the year 1827, Napoleon was gone, and the French Revolution was gone, but the steam engine had come and was filling the world with a sound that had nothing in common with the dreams of the Third Symphony. Indeed, the new order of steam and iron and coal and large factories had little use for art, for painting and sculpture and poetry and music. The old protectors of the arts, the church, and the princes and the merchants of the Middle Ages and the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries no longer existed. The leaders of the new industrial world were too busy, and had too little education to bother about etchings and sonatas and bits of carved ivory, not to speak of the men who created those things, and who were of no practical use to the community in which they lived. And the workmen in the factories listened to the drone of their engines, until they too had lost all taste for the melody of the flute or fiddle of their peasant ancestry. The arts became the stepchildren of the new industrial era. Art and life became entirely separated. Whatever paintings had been left were dying a slow death in the museums, and music became a monopoly of a few virtuosi who took the music away from the home and carried it to the concert hall. But steadily, although slowly, the arts are coming back into their own. People begin to understand that Rembrandt and Beethoven and Rodin are the true prophets and leaders of their race, and that a world without art and happiness resembles a nursery without laughter. End of chapter 61, read on June 3rd, 2009, in San Diego, California.
Chapter 62 of the Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loan. Chapter 62 Colonial Expansion and War. A chapter which ought to give you a great deal of political information about the last fifty years but which really contains several explanations and a few apologies. If I had known how difficult it was to write a history of the world, I should never have undertaken the task. Of course, any one possessed of enough industry to lose himself for half a dozen years in the musty stacks of a library can compile a ponderous tome, which gives an account of the events in every land during every century. But that was not the purpose of the present book. The publishers wanted to print a history that should have rhythm, a story which galloped rather than walked, and now that I have almost finished, I discover that certain chapters gallop, that others wade slowly through the dreary sands of long-forgotten ages, that a few parts do not make any progress at all, while still others indulge in a veritable jazz of action and romance. I did not like this, and I suggested that we destroy the whole manuscript and begin once more from the beginning. This, however, the publishers would not allow. As the next best solution of my difficulties, I took the typewritten pages to a number of charitable friends, and asked them to read what I had said, and give me the benefit of their advice. The experience was rather disheartening. Each and every man had his own prejudices, and his own hobbies and preferences. They all wanted to know why, where, and how I dared to omit their pet nation, their pet statesman, or even their most beloved criminal. With some of them, Napoleon and Genghis Khan were candidates for high honors. I explained that I had tried very hard to be fair to Napoleon, but that in my estimation he was greatly inferior to such men as George Washington, Gustavus Vasa, Augustus, Hammurabi, or Lincoln, and a score of others, all of whom were obliged to content themselves with a few paragraphs from sheer lack of space. As for Genghis Khan, I only recognized his superior ability in the field of wholesale murder, and I did not intend to give him any more publicity than I could help. Here you see a picture of a log cabin with a single man walking up to it, and it's entitled The Pioneer. This is very well as far as it goes, said the next critic, but how about the Puritans? We are celebrating the tercentenary of their arrival at Plymouth. They ought to have more space. My answer was that if I were writing a history of America, the Puritans would get fully one half of the first twelve chapters, that, however, this was a history of mankind, and that the event on Plymouth Rock was not a matter of far-reaching international importance until many centuries later, that the United States had been founded by thirteen colonies and not by a single one, that the most prominent leaders of the first twenty years of our history had been from Virginia, from Pennsylvania, and from the island of Nevis, rather than from Massachusetts, and that therefore the Puritans ought to content themselves with a page of print and a special map. Next came the prehistoric specialist. Why in the name of the great Tyrannosaur had I not devoted more space to the wonderful race of Cro-Magnon men, who had developed such a high stage of civilization ten thousand years ago? Indeed, and why not? The reason is simple. I do not take as much stock in the perfection of these early races as some of our most noted anthropologists seem to do. Rousseau and the philosophers of the 18th century created the noble savage, who was supposed to have dwelt in a state of perfect happiness during the beginning of time. Our modern scientists have discarded the noble savage so dearly beloved by our grandfathers, and they have replaced him by the splendid savage of the French valleys, who 35,000 years ago made an end to the universal rule of the low-browed and low-living brutes of the Neanderthal and other Germanic neighborhoods. They have shown us the elephants the Cro-Magnon painted, and the statues he carved, and they have surrounded him with much glory. I do not mean to say that they are wrong, but I hold that we know by far too little of this entire period to reconstruct that early West European society with any degree, however humble, of accuracy and I would rather not state certain things that run the risk of stating certain things that were not so. Then there were other critics, who accused me of direct unfairness. Why did I leave out such countries as Ireland and Bulgaria and Siam, while I dragged in such other countries as Holland and Iceland and Switzerland? My answer was that I did not drag in any countries, 
They pushed themselves in by main force of circumstances, and I simply could not keep them out. And, in order that my point may be understood, let me state the basis upon which active membership to this book of history was considered. There was but one rule. Did the country or the person in question produce a new idea or perform an original act without which the history of the entire human race would have been different? It was not a question of personal taste. It was a matter of cool, almost mathematical, judgment. No race ever played a more picturesque role in history than the Mongolians, and no race, from the point of view of achievement or intelligent progress, was of less value to the rest of mankind. The career of Tiglath Pileser, the Assyrian, is full of dramatic episodes, but, as far as we are concerned, he might just as well never have existed at all. In the same way, the history of the Dutch Republic is not interesting, because once upon a time the sailors of de Reuter went fishing in the river Thames, but rather because of the small fact that this small mud-bank along the shores of the North Sea offered a hospitable asylum to all sorts of strange people, who had all sorts of queer ideas upon all sorts of very unpopular subjects. It is quite true that Athens or Florence, during the heyday of their glory, had only one-tenth of the population of Kansas City, but our present civilization would be very different had neither of these two little cities of the Mediterranean basin existed. And the same, with due apologies to the good people of Wyandotte County, can hardly be said of this busy metropolis on the Missouri River. And, since I am being very personal, allow me to state one other fact. When we visit a doctor, we find out beforehand whether he is a surgeon, or a diagnostician, or a homeopath, or a faith healer, for we want to know from what angle he will look at our complaint. We ought to be as careful in the choice of our historians as we are in the selection of our physicians. We think, oh well, history is history, and let it go at that but the writer who was educated in a strictly Presbyterian household somewhere in the backwoods of Scotland will look differently upon every question of human relationships from his neighbor, who as a child was dragged to listen to the brilliant exhortations of Robert Ingersoll, the enemy of all revealed devils. In due course of time, both men may forget their early training, and never again visit either church or lecture hall but the influence of these impressionable years stays with them, and they cannot escape showing it in whatever they write or say or do. In the preface to this book, I told you that I should not be an infallible guide, and now that we have almost reached the end, I repeat the warning. I was born and educated in an atmosphere of the old-fashioned liberalism, which had followed the discoveries of Darwin and the other pioneers of the 19th century. As a child, I happened to spend most of my waking hours with an uncle who was a great collector of the books written by Montaigne, the great French essayist of the 16th century. Because I was born in Rotterdam, and educated in the city of Gouda, I ran continually across Erasmus, and for some unknown reason this great exponent of tolerance took hold of my intolerant self. Later I discovered Anatole France, and my first experience with the English language came about through an accidental encounter with Thackeray's Henry Esmond, a story which made more impression upon me than any other book in the English language. If I had been born in a pleasant Middle Western city, I probably should have a certain affection for the hems which I had learned in my childhood. But my earliest recollection of music goes back to the afternoon when my mother took me to hear nothing less than a Bach fugue, and the mathematical perfection of the great Protestant master influenced me to such an extent that I cannot hear the usual hymns of our prayer meeting without a feeling of intense agony and direct pain. Again, if I had been born in Italy, and had been warmed by the sunshine of the happy valley of the Arno, I might love many colorful and sunny pictures which now leave me indifferent, because I got my first artistic impressions in a country where the rare sun beats down upon the rain-soaked land with almost cruel brutality, and throws everything into violent contrasts of dark and light. I state these few facts deliberately, that you may know the personal bias of the man who wrote this history, and may understand his point of view. The bibliography at the end of this book, which represents all sorts of opinions and views, will allow you to compare my ideas with those of other people, and in this way you will be able to reach your own final conclusions with a greater degree of fairness than would otherwise be possible. Here you see a picture of a very large covered wagon in a desert setting titled Conquest of the West. 
After this short but necessary excursion, we return to the history of the last fifty years. Many things happened during this period, but very little occurred which at the time seemed to be of paramount importance. The majority of the greater powers ceased to be mere political agencies and became large business enterprises. They built railroads, they founded and subsidized steamship lines to all parts of the world, they connected their different possessions with telegraph wires, and they steadily increased their holdings in other continents. Every available bit of African or Asiatic territory was claimed by one of the rival powers. France became a colonial nation, with interests in Algiers and Madagascar and Anam and Tonkin in eastern Asia. Germany claimed parts of southwest and east Africa, built settlements in Cameroon on the west coast of Africa and in New Guinea and many of the islands of the Pacific, and used the murder of a few missionaries as a welcome excuse to take the harbor of Kosakau in the Yellow Sea in China. Italy tried her luck in Abyssinia, was disastrously defeated by the soldiers of the Negus, and consoled herself by occupying the Turkish possessions in Tripoli in northern Africa. Russia, having occupied all of Siberia, took Port Arthur away from China. Japan, having defeated China in the War of 1895, occupied the island of Formosa, and in the year 1905 began to lay claim to the entire empire of Korea. In the year 1883, England, the largest colonial empire the world has ever seen, undertook to protect Egypt. She performed this task most efficiently, and to the great material benefit of that much-neglected country, which ever since the opening of the Suez Canal in 1868 had been threatened with a foreign invasion. During the next thirty years, she fought a number of colonial wars in different parts of the world, and in 1902, after three years of bitter fighting, she conquered the independent Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Meanwhile, she had encouraged Cecil Rhodes to lay the foundations for a great African state, which reached from the Cape almost to the mouth of the Nile, and had faithfully picked up such islands or provinces as had been left without a European owner. The shrewd king of Belgium, by name Leopold, used the discoveries of Henry Staley to found the Congo Free State in the year 1885. Originally, this gigantic tropical empire was an absolute monarchy, but after many years of scandalous mismanagement, it was annexed by the Belgian people who made it a colony in the year 1908, and abolished the terrible abuses which had been tolerated by this very unscrupulous majesty, who cared nothing for the fate of the natives as long as he got his ivory and rubber. As for the United States, they had so much land that they desired no further territory, but the terrible misrule of Cuba, one of the last of the Spanish possessions in the Western Hemisphere, practically forced the Washington government to take action. After a short and rather uneventful war, the Spaniards were driven out of Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Philippines, and the two latter became colonies of the United States. This economic development of the world was perfectly natural. The increasing number of factories in England and France and Germany needed an ever-increasing amount of raw materials, and the equally increasing number of European workers needed an ever-increasing amount of food. Everywhere the cry was for more and for richer markets, for more easily accessible coal mines and iron mines and rubber plantations and oil wells, for greater supplies of wheat and grain. The purely political events of the European continent dwindled to mere insignificance in the eyes of men who were making plans for steamboat lines on Victoria Nyanza or for railroads through the interior of Shantung. They knew that many European questions still remained to be settled, but they did not bother, and through sheer indifference and carelessness they bestowed upon their descendants a terrible inheritance of hate and misery. For untold centuries the southeastern corner of Europe had been the scene of rebellion and bloodshed. During the seventies of the last century, the people of Serbia and Bulgaria and Montenegro and Romania were once more trying to gain their freedom, and the Turks, with the support of many of the Western powers, were trying to prevent this. After a period of particularly atrocious massacres in Bulgaria in the year 1876, the Russian people lost all patience. The government was forced to intervene just as President McKinley was obliged to go to Cuba and stop the shooting squads of General Weiler in Havana. In April of the year 1877, the Russian armies crossed the Danube, stormed the Shipka Pass, 
and after the capture of Plevna, marched southward until they reached the gates of Constantinople. Turkey appealed for help to England. There were many English people who denounced their government when it took the side of the Sultan, but Disraeli, who had just made Queen Victoria Empress of India, and who loved the picturesque Turks while he hated the Russians, who were brutally cruel to the Jewish people within their frontiers, decided to interfere. Russia was forced to conclude the Peace of San Stefano, 1878, and the question of the Balkans was left to a Congress, which convened at Berlin in June and July of the same year. This famous conference was entirely dominated by the personality of Disraeli. Even Bismarck feared the clever old man with his well-oiled curly hair and his supreme arrogance, tempered by a cynical sense of humor and a marvelous gift for flattery. At Berlin, the British Prime Minister carefully watched over the fate of his friends, the Turks. Montenegro, Serbia, and Romania were recognized as independent kingdoms. The Principality of Bulgaria was given a semi-independent status under Prince Alexander of Battenberg, a nephew of Tsar Alexander II. But none of those countries were given the chance to develop their powers and their resources as they would have been able to do had England been less anxious about the fate of the Sultan, whose domains were necessary to the safety of the British Empire as a bulwark against further Russian aggression. To make matters worse, the Congress allowed Austria to take Bosnia and Herzegovina away from the Turks to be administered as part of the Habsburg domains. It is true that Austria made an excellent job of it. The neglected provinces were as well managed as the best of the British colonies, and that is saying a great deal. But they were inhabited by many Serbians. In older days, they had been a part of the great Serbian empire of Stefan Dushan, who early in the 14th century had defended Western Europe against the invasions of the Turks, and whose capital of Uskub had been a center of civilization 150 years before Columbus discovered the new lands of the West. The Serbians remembered their ancient glory, as who would not? They resented the presence of the Austrians in two provinces, which, so they felt, were theirs by every right of tradition. And it was in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, that the Archduke Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne, was murdered on June twenty eighth of the year nineteen fourteen. The assassin was a Serbian student who had acted from purely patriotic motives. But the blame for this terrible catastrophe, which was the immediate, though not the only cause of the great world war, did not lie with the half crazy Serbian boy or his Austrian victim. It must be traced back to the days of the famous Berlin Conference, when Europe was too busy building a material civilization to care about the aspirations and the dreams of a forgotten race in a dreary corner of the old Balkan Peninsula. End of chapter 62 Recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, June 2009Chapter 63 of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. Chapter 63 A New World. The Great War, which was really the struggle for a new and better world. The Marquis de Condorcet was one of the noblest characters among the small group of honest enthusiasts who were responsible for the outbreak of the great French Revolution. He had devoted his life to the cause of the poor and the unfortunate. He had been one of the assistants of d'Alembert and Diderot when they wrote their famous encyclopedia. During the first years of the Revolution he had been the leader of the moderate wing of the Convention. His tolerance, his kindliness, his stout common sense, had made him an object of suspicion when the treason of the king and the court clique had given the extreme radicals their chance to get hold of the government and kill their opponents. Condorcet was declared hors de loi, or outlawed, an outcast who was henceforth at the mercy of every true patriot. His friends offered to hide him at their own peril. Condorcet refused to accept their sacrifice. He escaped, and tried to reach his home, where he might be safe. After three nights in the open, torn and bleeding, he entered an inn, and asked for some food. 
The suspicious yokels searched him, and in his pockets they found a copy of Horace, the Latin poet. This showed that their prisoner was a man of gentle breeding, and had no business upon the high roads at a time when every educated person was regarded as an enemy of the revolutionary state. They took Condorcet, and they bound him, and they gagged him, and they threw him into the village lock-up, but in the morning when the soldiers came to drag him back to Paris and cut his head off, behold, he was dead. This man, who had given all, and had received nothing, had good reason to despair of the human race. But he has written a few sentences which ring as true to-day as they did one hundred and thirty years ago. I repeat them here, for your benefit. Nature has set no limits to our hopes, he wrote, and the picture of the human race, now freed from its chains, and marching with a firm tread on the road of truth and virtue and happiness, offers to the philosopher a spectacle which consoles him for the errors, for the crimes and the injustices, which still pollute and afflict this earth. The world has just passed through an agony of pain, compared to which the French Revolution was a mere incident. The shock has been so great that it has killed the last spark of hope in the breasts of millions of men. They were chanting a hymn of progress, and four years of slaughter followed their prayers for peace. Is it worth while, so they ask, to work and slave for the benefit of creatures who have not yet passed beyond the stage of the earliest cavemen? There is but one answer. That answer is yes. The World War was a terrible calamity, but it did not mean the end of things. On the contrary, it brought about the coming of a new day. It is easy to write a history of Greece and Rome or the Middle Ages. The actors who played their parts upon that long-forgotten stage are all dead. We can criticize them with a cool head. The audience that applauded their efforts has dispersed. Our remarks cannot possibly hurt their feelings. But it is very difficult to give a true account of contemporary events. The problems that fill the minds of the people with whom we pass through life are our own problems, and they hurt us too much, or they please us too well, to be described with that fairness which is necessary when we are writing history, and not blowing the trumpet of propaganda. All the same, I shall endeavour to tell you why I agree with poor Condorcet, when he expressed his firm faith in a better future. Often before I have warned you against the false impression which is created by the use of our so-called historical epochs, which divide the story of man into four parts, the ancient world, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and the Reformation, and modern time. The last of these terms is the most dangerous. The word modern implies that we, the people of the twentieth century, are at the top of human achievement. Fifty years ago the liberals of England who followed the leadership of Gladstone felt that the problem of a truly representative and democratic form of government had been solved for ever by the second great reform bill, which gave workmen an equal share in the government with their employers. When Disraeli and his conservative friends talked of a dangerous leap in the dark, they answered no. They felt certain of their cause, and trusted that henceforth all classes of society would cooperate to make the government of their common country a success. Since then many things have happened, and the few liberals who are still alive begin to understand that they were mistaken. There is no definite answer to any historical problem. Every generation must fight the good fight anew, or perish as those sluggish animals of the prehistoric world have perished. If you once get hold of this great truth, you will get a new and much broader view of life. Then go one step further, and try to imagine yourself in the position of your own great-great-grandchildren, who will take your place in the year ten thousand. They too will learn history, but what will they think of those short four thousand years during which we have kept a written record of our actions and of our thoughts? They will think of Napoleon as a contemporary of Tiglath-Pileser, the Assyrian conqueror. 
perhaps they will confuse him with Genghis Khan or Alexander the Macedonian. The great war which has just come to an end will appear in the light of that long commercial conflict which settled the supremacy of the Mediterranean when Rome and Carthage fought during one hundred and twenty-eight years for the mastery of the sea. The Balkan troubles of the nineteenth century, the struggle for freedom of Serbia and Greece and Bulgaria and Montenegro, to them will seem a continuation of the disordered conditions caused by the great migrations. They will look at pictures of the Rhyme Cathedral, which only yesterday was destroyed by German guns, as we look upon a photograph of the Acropolis, ruined two hundred and fifty years ago during a war between the Turks and the Venetians. They will regard the fear of death, which is still common among many people, as a childish superstition, which was perhaps natural in a race of men who had burned witches as late as the year 1692. Even our hospitals and our laboratories and our operating rooms, of which we are so proud, will look like slightly improved workshops of alchemists and medieval surgeons. And the reason for all this is simple. We modern men and women are not modern at all. On the contrary, we still belong to the last generations of the cave-dwellers. The foundation for a new era was laid but yesterday. The human race was given its first chance to become truly civilized, when it took courage to question all things, and made knowledge and understanding the foundation upon which to create a more reasonable and sensible society of human beings. The Great War was the growing pain of this new world. For a long time to come people will write mighty books to prove that this or that or the other person brought about the war. The socialists will publish volumes in which they will accuse the capitalists of having brought about the war for commercial gain. The capitalists will answer that they lost infinitely more through the war than they made, that their children were among the first to go and fight and be killed, and they will show how in every country the bankers tried their very best to avert the outbreak of hostilities. French historians will go through the register of German sins from the days of Charlemagne until the days of William of Hohenzollern, and German historians will return the compliment, and will go through the list of French horrors from the days of Charlemagne until the days of President Poincar. And then they will establish to their own satisfaction that the other fellow was guilty of causing the war. Statesmen, dead and not yet dead in all countries, will take to their typewriters, and they will explain how they tried to avert hostilities, and how their wicked opponents forced them into it. The historian a hundred years hence will not bother about these apologies and vindications. He will understand the real nature of the underlying causes, and he will know that personal ambitions and personal wickedness and personal greed had very little to do with the final outburst. The original mistake, which was responsible for all this misery, was committed when our scientists began to create a new world of steel and iron, and chemistry and electricity, and forgot that the human mind is slower than the proverbial turtle, is lazier than the well-known sloth, and marches from one hundred to three hundred years behind the small group of courageous leaders. A Zulu in a frock-coat is still a Zulu. A dog trained to ride a bicycle and smoke a pipe is still a dog. And a human being with the mind of a sixteenth-century tradesman driving a 1921 Rolls-Royce is still a human being with the mind of a sixteenth-century tradesman. If you do not understand this at first, read it again. It will become clearer to you in a moment, and it will explain many things that have happened these last six years. Perhaps I may give you another, more familiar example, to show you what I mean. In the movie theatres, jokes and funny remarks are often thrown upon the screen. Watch the audience the next time you have a chance. A few people seem almost to inhale the words. It takes them but a second to read the lines. Others are a bit slower. Still others take from twenty to thirty seconds. Finally, those men and women who do not read any more than they can help get the point when the brighter ones among the audience have already begun to decipher the next cut-in. 
it is not different in human life, as I shall now show you. In a former chapter I have told you how the idea of the Roman Empire continued to live for a thousand years after the death of the last Roman Emperor. It caused the establishment of a large number of imitation empires. It gave the bishops of Rome a chance to make themselves the head of the entire church, because they represented the idea of Roman world supremacy. It drove a number of perfectly harmless barbarian chieftains into a career of crime and endless warfare, because they were forever under the spell of this magic word, Rome. All these people, popes, emperors, and plain fighting men, were not very different from you or me, but they lived in a world where the Roman tradition was a vital issue, something living, something which was remembered clearly both by the father and the son and the grandson. And so they struggled and sacrificed themselves for a cause which to-day would not find a dozen recruits. In still another chapter I have told you how the great religious wars took place more than a century after the first open act of the Reformation. And if you will compare the chapter on the Thirty Years' War with that on inventions, you will see that this ghastly butchery took place at a time when the first clumsy steam engines were already puffing in the laboratories of a number of French and German and English scientists. But the world at large took no interest in these strange contraptions, and went on with a grand theological discussion which to-day causes yawns, but no anger. And so it goes. A thousand years from now the historian will use the same words about Europe of the outgoing nineteenth century, and he will see how men were engaged upon terrific nationalistic struggles, while the laboratories all around them were filled with serious folk, who cared not one whit for politics, as long as they could force nature to surrender a few more of her million secrets. You will gradually begin to understand what I am driving at. The engineer and the scientist and the chemist, within a single generation, fill Europe and America and Asia with their vast machines, with their telegraphs, their flying machines, their coal-tar products. They created a new world in which time and space were reduced to complete insignificance. They invented new products, and they made these so cheap that almost everyone could buy them. I have told you all this before, but it certainly will bear repeating. To keep the ever-increasing number of factories going, the owners, who had also become the rulers of the land, needed raw materials and coal, especially coal. Meanwhile the mass of the people were still thinking in terms of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, and clinging to the old notions of the state as a dynastic or political organization. This clumsy medieval institution was then suddenly called upon to handle the highly modern problems of a mechanical and industrial world. It did its best, according to the rules of the game which had been laid down centuries before. The different states created enormous armies and gigantic navies, which were used for the purpose of acquiring new possessions in distant lands. Wherever there was a tiny bit of land left, there arose an English or a French or a German or a Russian colony. If the natives objected, they were killed. In most cases they did not object, and were allowed to live peacefully, provided they did not interfere with the diamond mines, or the coal mines, or the oil mines, or the gold mines, or the rubber plantations, and they derived many benefits from the foreign occupation. Sometimes it happened that two states in search of raw materials wanted the same piece of land at the same time. Then there was a war. This occurred fifteen years ago when Russia and Japan fought for the possession of certain territories which belonged to the Chinese people. Such conflicts, however, were the exception. No one really desired to fight. Indeed, the idea of fighting with armies and battleships and submarines began to seem absurd to the men of the early twentieth century. They associated the idea of violence with the long-ago age of unlimited monarchies and intriguing dynasties. Every day they read in their papers of still further inventions, of groups of English and American and German scientists, who were working together in perfect friendship for the purpose of an advance in medicine or in astronomy. 
they lived in a busy world of trade and of commerce and factories. But only a few noticed that the development of the state, of the gigantic community of people who recognize certain common ideals, was lagging several hundred years behind. They tried to warn the others, but the others were occupied with their own affairs. I have used so many similes that I must apologize for bringing in one more. The ship of state, that old and trusted expression which is ever new and always picturesque, of the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Venetians, and the merchant adventurers of the seventeenth century, had been a sturdy craft, constructed of well-seasoned wood, and commanded by officers who knew both their crew and their vessel, and who understood the limitations of the art of navigating which had been handed down to them by their ancestors. Then came the new age of iron and steel and machinery. First one part, then another of the old ship of state was changed. Her dimensions were increased. The sails were discarded for steam. Better living quarters were established, but more people were forced to go down into the stoke-hole, and while the work was safe and fairly remunerative, they did not like it as well as their old and more dangerous job in the rigging. Finally, and almost imperceptibly, the old wooden square rigger had been transformed into a modern ocean liner. But the captain and the mates remained the same. They were appointed or elected in the same way as a hundred years before. They were taught the same system of navigation which had served the mariners of the fifteenth century. In their cabins hung the same charts and signal flags which had done service in the days of Louis the Fourteenth and Frederick the Great. In short, they were, through no fault of their own, completely incompetent. The sea of international politics is not very broad. When those imperial and colonial liners began to try and outrun each other, accidents were bound to happen. They did happen. You can still see the wreckage, if you venture to pass through that part of the ocean. And the moral of the story is a simple one. The world is in dreadful need of men who will assume the new leadership, who will have the courage of their own visions, and who will recognize clearly that we are only at the beginning of the voyage, and have to learn an entirely new system of seamanship. They will have to serve for years as mere apprentices, they will have to fight their way to the top against every possible form of opposition. When they reach the bridge, mutiny of an envious crew may cause their death, but some day a man will arise who will bring the vessel safely to port, and he shall be the hero of the ages. End of chapter 63 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on June 5th, 2009, in San Diego, California. Chapter 64 of the Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loon. CHAPTER 64 AS IT SHALL EVER BE The more I think of the problems of our lives, the more I am persuaded that we ought to choose irony and pity for our assessors and judges as the ancient Egyptians called upon the goddess Isis and the goddess Nephthys on behalf of their dead. Irony and pity are both of good counsel. The first with her smiles makes life agreeable, the other sanctifies it with her tears. The irony which I invoke is no cruel deity. She mocks neither love nor beauty. She is gentle and kindly disposed. Her mirth disarms, and it is she who teaches us to laugh at rogues and fools, whom but for her we might be so weak as to despise and hate. And with these wise words of a very great Frenchman, I bid you farewell. 8 Barrow Street, New York, Saturday, June twenty sixth, 21. End of chapter 64 Recorded by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, June 2009. End of the Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Lohn.